Tuesday, April 20th, 21st, uh, regular meeting of the San Ynez Valley Union High School District Board of Education. The time is 5.30. Um, and uh, Terry, would you note that uh, Dr. Bakey is not here, please? All right, let's stand for the flag salute. The flag is right over here. Ready to begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. All right. Um, I need uh, item number four A approval of the agenda. I need a motion to approve the agenda tonight. I so move. Thank you, Tori. A second. Jose Juan second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All right, roll call vote, Terry. Mrs. Babcock. Aye. Mr. Luke. Aye. Mrs. Clevenger. Aye. Mr. Ibarra. Aye. Motion carries 4 0. Thank you. All right, on to item B the superintendent's reports and presentations. Uh, item one student representative update, Ella Hoos. So I want to take just a moment to celebrate the fact that we are looking at each other in person. This is really something. And uh, if you didn't hear Santa Barbara County Public Health today, we're officially in the orange tier as of tomorrow at 8. Uh, you were about ready to correct me. Tomorrow at 8 a.m. we'll officially be in the orange tier, which is another, another thing to celebrate as well, which opens up other opportunities for us and kids and all, all kinds of good things. But um, speaking of students, Ella, it's good to see you. Please go ahead. Oh, can you guys hear me? Oh, hello. Hi. You can, um, you can lean back just a little bit. Okay. Like is this better? I'm, see, I'm still learning, just like all of you. I have no idea what I'm doing. Hi, this is so nice to see all of you and put names to faces. And this actually makes me almost cry because of how far we've come. We have six weeks left of school, and that is terrifying as a senior, as someone who knows commitment day is next week. Um, I committed. I'm going to the University of Arizona. Go Wildcats for class of 2025. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was that's super exciting. I know you all have followed me along on this journey, so I thought it was only fitting I had to update you. So um, here's my update. This week is Alcohol Awareness Week, so ASB is putting on a couple different fun events. If you are here on Friday, we have a very special event planned. I know we're working with our sheriff on campus. It was very fun to have you in class today. He brought some goggles that simulate what it is like to be under the influence of alcohol. And so we're going to be doing a little bit of teaching moment to show kids what it's like and that it's not good. And so just really showing the effects of how alcohol affects you, your vision, your body, and your overall decision making. Uh, we wore red today. Um, I, if you came on campus, I'm sure you saw some of the ASB kids wearing red. I was wearing very bright colored red flare pants. So I definitely had a lot of fun dressing up for dress up days. Um, we're back on four days a week for school, which is so much fun. I love it. I love seeing more people on campus, seeing the parking lots full in the morning, seeing my friends pull in. And especially this morning, it felt almost like you were walking into Disneyland. Like you saw people driving in and waving oh my god there's new people here oh my god i didn't know they were coming back and that was such an overwhelming great feeling our sports are still going on i know football season just ended and we started swim there's a lot of events going on i know tennis is almost done so that's very hard to see i know we kind of push sports all together in one little time frame but it's very exciting to see i'm really glad i get to see some of my friends compete 
one last time. The juniors got their SATs back and they're starting the transition into college. I sat down with my brother last night. We did the whole college search of your major and what you like. So that's been really exciting to hear the junior class start that buzz of, oh, do you want to major in this? Do you want to go here? Uh, senior week is going to be coming up in a couple weeks. Uh, we got the okay to do a couple of things. I know we're trying, I don't want to say this is for sure, to do a senior car decorating day. And I know for those of you who aren't aware of what this is, it's one morning where the parents come and they and the siblings of the graduates and they decorate their cars. They ride on it, they put balloons, paintings, pictures, and it's a big event where people take pictures with the seniors and pictures of their cars. I think we're gonna do the parade again. ASB is really trying to organize that just as last year. I know that many of you had asked me about seeing where seniors are going to end up, and we're actually starting an Instagram account where you, people will send in their bios, their names, and where they're attending, so you can see where everyone goes, whether it be in the Army or the Marines, a city college, a four-year, a private university, or just their after high school plans. Um, let's see, the Pirate Podcast just came out, which is on Spotify. If you want to check that out, we interview different students on different perspectives and just hearing about high school events and their decisions with everything. Um, I also, along the lines of college, I have a bunch of other friends who committed. This year is a huge year for seniors. Um, I'd like to note we have one girl who received a full ride to Stanford University, and she'll be going to Stanford, and another girl who received a full ride to the University of Southern California. So that is super exciting to see. I've known these girls, I've grown up with them, so that was definitely a cheery moment hearing about their achievements, and it's so well-deserved. Other than that, do you have any questions for me? Thank you, Ella. Uh, exciting times, et cetera. I'm trying to get back to a little bit of normalcy before the end of the school year. Thank you. Of course. I'm very sad to announce that the next, the next board meeting is my last one with you guys, so I will probably cry and be very sad because... We'll bring tissue. Okay. <laughs> I will miss you all very much. Thanks, Ella. You're always welcome to come in, Jim, standing up for <laughs> See how much you really <laughs> All right. Uh, on to item number two, which is the uh, district wellness policy, Superintendent Corey. You bet. I would like to invite um, our health and wellness coordinator, Claudia Pena, to the podium. Thank you so much for being here. You had a chance to read um, the background information um, in addition to multiple documents that were um, attached as well. Uh, this is really an opportunity for me personally to thank um, Claudia for the work that she has put into this. Um, because of COVID and everything, we had some delays. Um, we have taken various runs at this before, um, and but this time, uh, Claudia really brought a level of excellence um, to, to this update. And so coordinating all the good things that are happening on campus that contribute to wellness for all of our students. And so I just wanted to give her an opportunity, and she has um, a presentation. Do you need a pointer at all? Oh, you've got it. You're good. You look good. So um, I will get out of the way and let you continue. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, thank you all for having me. You know what? Let me turn that on right here. Claudia, when you're speaking, you can take off your mask. Okay. Okay. How about now? Perfect. Great. So, yes, thank you for having me. My name is Claudia Finney. I'm the Health and Wellness Coordinator. Um, so yes, what is a wellness policy, right? So basically it's a written document that guides um, an LEA or a local st school district um, in an effort to create a supportive environment um, for the entire school. Um, and it is also a required uh, document for schools who participate in the um, child nutrition program, such as the National School Lunch Program or School Breakfast Program. So it is federally, federally required for um, per school districts to accept those, um, those services. Um, and it was also part of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010. Um, so wellness policies are also part of that act and, and something that is required of school districts. Um, just a little history. So our current policy was from 2017. So we were actually due for our triennial last year in March, but due to COVID, um, that didn't happen, so we're a little bit, a um, little bit late, but um, this is the new one. So, um, so the 2017 policy. So what we did was um, the wellness team and I met two times, and we utilized um, 
the WellSAT assessment. And so that is a comprehensive tool developed by the University of Connecticut, and that is to evaluate wellness plans. Um, and that was based on the 2017-28 USDA standards. That's what the WellSAT was created for. So basically, we use that as a tool to evaluate policies. So we utilized the WellSAT, and we um, administered the WellSAT assessment electronically among the staff. And we looked at our 2017 policy and figured out the areas that we needed some support in, what we were doing well in, and then used those recommendations to write the new wellness policy. So these are the scores up here that we received. Um, and there are some major categories, as you can see, nutrition, education standards for USDA school meals, nutrition standards, physical education and physical activity, wellness promotion and marketing, evaluation, and then overall policy. So as you can see, we scored a little bit lower in nutrition education, and I'll get into that in a minute, um, and also in nutrition standards. So those are some of our scores. And I felt like it was really helpful for us as a wellness team because not only does the WellSet give you scores, but it also gives you links and resources. Um, to, so while you're writing the new policy, you kind of have some things to refer to. So, um, so the new policy based on our WellSet assessments was, um, you know, I made some big improvements in nutrition and health education. Um, and basically, we scored pretty low because we didn't have a health class, right, at that time. So that was a huge win for us, is having the, the ninth grade health class for all ninth graders. So that helped boost our score. So that was one of the reasons why we scored lower. Also, in the 2017 policy, we didn't have any statement about student meal accounts, specifically for students who owed money on their accounts. And there is a clause where we have to state that a student would not be stigmatized. Um, so that was added to the new one. Um, and then also obtaining local food. So utilizing uh, local agencies and uh, local food sources. Um, and then PE, we, add, we added a statement um, regarding course requirements. Um, and that is also going to be included in the new registration guidelines. Um, and then also an exemption policy for students was added. Um, and then also I added the community partnerships, such as agency collaboration, which we are collaborating with so many agencies. Our biggest partner is PHP, of course, YouthWell, um, San Inez Valley Youth Coalition, um, my goodness, Fighting Back San Marino Valley, uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, CADA. So I added all of those to the new policy. Um, and then, of course, I added all the wellness activities we've been doing this year, lots of staff challenges, and of course, alcohol awareness week and lots of things like that so um, and then of course it is available in Spanish and it is translated um, and then also some newer updates to the newest policy were that I added a health services section so I included all the nursing supports and things that are in place um, right now for students for health services and then of course social emotional health I implemented you know just everything that we're doing for MTSS and tier two supporting students with their social emotional health also we're implementing a tier one curriculum meaning it's for all students we're utilizing the Y tri curriculum the social emotional curriculum right now and then last I, I included the safe school environment so everything that we're doing on campus to promote uh, safety such as our youth prevention task force that meets monthly um, and um, our new attendance policy and our behavior matrix that is based on our positive behavior intervention supports and then i also included an accountability document so a wellness policy is great right but someone needs to manage that and make sure that these things are actually getting done and set goals and timelines so i attached also an accountability document to go along with this and so basically every three years, we will be administering the well set again, and of course, always making improvements and, you know, and it's a living document, so we can make updates at any time. Um, so every three years, we'll be using the well set and then of course, incorporating a wellness policy into our WASC report every three years. And then annually, we are supposed to be utilizing an annual um, assessment, which is the school health index. And then we also are going to be incorporating that into our LCAP as well. So, and that's it. Any questions for me? Are there any questions for yeah. Claudia? Just as a point of note, um, you know, one of the things that Claudia has done really well is you know, engaged the 
lot of different groups, including community partners. Um, and again, that, that takes someone really spending a lot of time to reach out and communicate with all those partners. So thank you very much um, for, for doing that. And so um, and the companion piece with the accountability um, document that's in here too. Okay, so it's a great plan, but how does it get done? When does it get done? Who does it? What are the timelines for that? Um, that's all in there too. So thank you very much for that work. At the May meeting, for the purposes of the board, we look at planning for 21-22. Um, we'll be having another conversation also about some other data points um, associated with the California Healthy Kids survey. So we'll be talking about that as well, and Claudia um, headed up um, that effort as well. And so um, in addition to, we'll also have Stephanie Gagonis and Michelle Board to set the meeting too, talking about some key data points from our WASC reports. So how do we set the board up saying, listen, this is why we're developing the goals that we are developing. For 21 and 22 and beyond, because the LCAP is a three year document. Um, so, all this is going to, uh, it's all going to fold in. In fact, we have a rather significant meeting tomorrow about that. Um, so, anyway, but these are, there's some really great data points for us in terms of developing goals for the district as we, as we move ahead for all of our kids. So, thank you very much for all the work with that. Claudia, I have a question. Yes. Um, and that is on, on the PE exemption. Mm -hmm. Do you know off the top, are, do we have a lot of students who, um, you know, are exempt from PE or is it just a, a real small, small percentage? Do you happen to know? From my understanding, it's pretty small. I worked on that section with Jen Rasmussen, mm -hmm. our department chair. Um, I know that is a requirement now and she, um, yeah, she said, I learned something today. I didn't even know this. So um, I sent that over to, to Scott and then we sent that to Melissa Shaw. So now it is now included in our course registration guide for next year. But yeah, from my understanding, I don't hear it too often and Jen was unfamiliar, so I don't think it's too common. I'm looking at Michelle, she's kind of like, yeah. Well, there's two parts of it here, the, the exemptions from PE period and um, just so if you have a like, physical fitness test, mm -hmm. right. if it's been weighed. Right. So I had very significant questions because I didn't know what that meant for our so for our freshmen currently that haven't had the P testing and being exempt, um, well not exempt, but you know, do we require them to take PE next year or the next year until they actually take it? And I was worried because um, if we didn't have them take it next year, because that's how we kind of judge whether they need to have they have to have PE next year because they're supposed to be in PE until they pass it. So um, at this point, um, I, all indications is that we won't. By the time the current freshmen become seniors, we won't be held accountable for that component of it. So we're only going to place students in PE next year that were freshmen uh, into the PE class based on their desire to continue and not planning on being in sports because sports is their only other exemption if they are involved in sports. And then there's another thing that we're going to look at as well um, because I know some families ask if their students are in the uh, equestrian or other mm -hmm. things that are activities outside because I. At some point, it was art. Can we exempt them? We can't exempt them unless we have like an independent study course in on place. So I have to look into that as well mm -hmm. to find out what a true exemption would look like for students that are involved and have evidence of working outside. And I'm working on that as well. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Claudia. Well, I, it's a nice job. I do, I do have a couple yes. of questions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, first, thank you, Ms. Bayer, for all the work you've done. I've heard nothing but wonderful things about all the work and, and how you've been able to put a lot of um, energy uh, mm -hmm. into collaboration with different entities in the community. And that's, that's great. Uh, so just a, a couple of questions. One is the uh, social emotional wellness and the safe school environment categories in the in the well set policy. Are those new this year? You know, in the well set policy, it focuses, the assessment focuses more on nutrition and physical activity. Okay. So that, is kind of a bonus that I incorporated that, but I thought it would be really good because we are stating that in our LCAP. And so I think, again, for me, it's just another layer of accountability, right? That we are progress monitoring. We are giving that attention every year. So that's, um, and I, you know, the gold standard is um, San Diego Unified School District. Um, their wellness policy is amazing. Um, and in collaboration with our wellness team, I was referred to that document. So I, was reaching out a lot to their coordinator and I got lots of tips for writing hours. So I kind of mimic theirs and I felt like it really addresses the whole child, you know, not just nutrition and physical education, but there's so many other components to, to wellness. Um, so, so no, it's not in there, but I think it needs to be because it's such a, a crucial part of, 
uh, for our students. Great, yeah. and same to you. And these two are, are central to the student experience Absolutely. Um, overall. And wondering if you can speak to how um, your team will assess uh, students' um, sense of, of safe school environment and um, yeah, first that, and then I'll go back to the emotional bonus. Thank you. Yes, so what I really love is that the Healthy Kids Survey is every two years, and it is pretty comprehensive, but I know it's only for ninth and 11th graders, but that is another question that, and that we just discussed in our Tier 1 meeting, is having a survey at the end of the year or the beginning of the year for students. Um, and I did survey students at the beginning of this year, and through that survey, I was able to identify different needs for programming, which would be you know, the Youth Prevention Task Force. Uh, Mary Conway from the San Indians Valley Youth Coalition is very involved. So I, I kind of took that over now that um, the district has a wellness coordinator. Um, so that, so those topics that we address in there really focus on, came, kind of came from those surveys from the beginning of the year for, from students. Um, yeah, and so we would use that. So serving students every year, that's my goal to do that. And then also utilizing the information from our Healthy Kids Survey every two years. So. That's great. Yeah, well, I'm a school psychologist, so I love assessments. <laughs> so I, I love progress monitoring and utilizing assessments. I think that's how we really get that objective data. Excellent. And mm -hmm. it, it would be wonderful to learn more as, as we go. Mm -hmm. and, and in developing an internal district uh, survey that perhaps could be done yearly, if, or even checkpoints. Uh, right. A couple of times a year, just to get a stronger sense of where resources need to be allocated, so we can best support you and your team, and ensuring that our students are getting what they need on that. And we do have a, a parent survey that will go out before the year is over. And in the past, and we still have to sit and talk about what those are going to look like. But in the past, it's included parents' perception of student safety because students' perception of safety and parents' perception of safety are sometimes two very different things. So how do we how do we find a good crossroads um, on on that? So it'll be another data point as well. That's great. And I would love to see if that survey um, before going out is possible just to, to see what we're asking as a district. Great. Thank you. Sounds wonderful. Thank you. And the uh, social and emotional mm -hmm. uh, wellness uh, approach to providing resources, can you speak a little bit more to what you plan, what is going on now, what you plan ahead for next year as hopefully a uh, student will be back on campus in, yes. in, in the masses, hopefully, in the right. fall, and, yeah. and how we're going to catch um, our kids. Yes, so I'm really excited. Um, I've been working with, well, we've all been working with Kimberly Green, who is a consultant um, for MTSS, um, and she and I have talked several times about administering a universal screener in the fall, um, so utilizing you know, a standardized assessment um, to assess all students. I'm looking into one that's electronic, so that as soon as the student hits submit, it's automatically scored and prepares a report because I don't think I could score 800 in some protocols. <laughs> That's a lot. So we're looking at that as our universal screener, kind of like as our baseline to give us, um, to help us kind of catch those students. Um, we currently have 125 students receiving tier two and tier three supports. Um, but the way this program works is it's not like, for example, your special education model where the students just roll over. It's kind of like you start from a clean slate. Um, so a lot of those, you know, obviously the referrals come from teachers and parents and students. So once we start in the fall, we'll kind of start from square one again and see where we're at. So I'm super excited to get that information from the, the universal screener. I think that will help us identify a lot of students who need supports. And I think, you know, by next year, I'll kind of know who some of the kids are already, obviously, because they've already been tiered. Uh, I just was curious what your personal caseload is as the school psychologist. You said tier two, about 125? It's 125, yes, but we have about nine facilitators. So it's not just me doing it. Oh, absolutely not. Uh, so I have a whole team. So we have facilitators doing check in, check out, doing mentoring. Um, we also, of course, offer tutoring. That's after school on Zoom. Um, we run skills groups. I just run a skills group. Uh, we do wellness checks with kids. Um, so there's lots of facilitators. Yeah, absolutely. And we do hear wonderful things about your work with kids individually. Just, just that's good. It's very moving to hear that because that's the center of the whole thing. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. It's a, just a privilege to be here, and I, and I just I love it. So I get to do it. I just get to help kids. <laughs> Sure. Sorry. Okay, cool. 
Um, my question for you is um, what types of students are you surveying and like how are you thinking about different factors? I know that if you look at the mental wellness of kids taking six AP courses versus kids who are not, it's a very huge change. And I'm just wondering how you take those outside factors into key when surveying, um, especially juniors, because that's the hardest year in high school. Right. Yeah, and I think that is why we created the self-care for teens class that's going on right now, and it's being offered virtually. Um, so it's exactly that. It's helping students come up with those coping skills that they need to deal with things like stress from school or personal life. Um, so that we just had our first class, and we just are starting our second, and I've heard really good things about it. But it kind of came from that. I was getting lots of referrals um, for our students who are in our AP and honors classes because they're so stressed with their workload. So um, so it kind of evolved from there. So yeah, I'm trying to meet every demographic in every area. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as we move ahead with hopefully everybody back on campus um, next um, in fall, um, Claudia's leadership in terms of how, because we'll be dealing with the fallout of, of all the stuff that we've been going through for the last year for several years to come. And so um, that lending, when she's a part of the leadership team for that very reason, how do we knit all those things together really well to help kids be successful in all areas? She really has been the, the tip of the spear in a lot of that. So uh, yeah. thank you very much for being here this evening. I, I have thank a, you, Claudia. Oh, I have one follow-up oh, question. You're allowed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and I'm curious about um, what's in, what's coming up ahead in terms of professional development for faculty and staff to yes. align them with the work that you've done with your team. Yeah. So as having everyone on the same page and providing them the information they need about uh, your, your programs, the intentions, mm -hmm. so they can then apply those in their learning environment. Yep, good question. Um, so we are working with Kimberly Brain, who is a consultant, and we are in the process of scheduling some professional development at the beginning of the school year. Um, just to get all teachers on board um, utilizing NTSS. So all teachers utilizing the services that are for all students, right, supports. Um, and also training, uh, doing a little bit more training with our guidance department um, really, and really embedding MTSS across all levels. Um, so I'm super excited for that. And then, um, of course, I, I will probably do a presentation as well at the beginning of the year, just like I did at the beginning of this year. Um, and I know myself and four other colleagues we're going to do an equity training really soon this week, so um, lots of really good things. Um, equity is another big issue for me, you know, on a personal level as well, being Latina. Um, and I wrote a grant this year, and I unfortunately didn't get it, but I'm not going to stop. And so I'm super excited, and that's definitely part of our overall plan. Um, I've also looked into some curriculum that addresses social, emotional, and equity. That's the ruler method, and I presented on that at the beginning of the year. My goal is to get that here within the school system, and that might mean a homeroom. I don't know. It just depends. But I have lots of things that I would like to see implemented that encompass not just the SEL stuff, but also equity as well. Yeah. And none of this really takes hold and becomes really effective to the point that we want it to be effective until staff are trained on the, on the front lines with the students in the classrooms. Right. So, yeah, we've been having lots of PD discussions yes. very recently, so that's a great question. Very timely. Thank you very much, Claudia. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, look Thank forward you. to seeing you again. Uh, we'll move on to item C, the public comment. Um, we have um, one in person this evening, and then I believe we have two to read, Terry. Okay, so first, I. Uh, Sandy Mullen, please uh, step up to the podium and thank you for being patient. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Is that okay? Thanks. Uh, no, I'm fascinating. Thank you. Well, it's, whew, it's my first public outing in over a year, so you should be proud. Uh, my name is Sandy Mullen, and I am the parent of two San Diego Valley High School graduates, and I have a son who is currently a junior at the school. All three are extraordinarily fortunate to have received stellar educations at San Ynez High School thanks to the teachers who work so tirelessly here. My daughters were well prepared to succeed at two of the top universities in the nation, and we don't know yet, but hopefully my son will experience the same thing. Jury's still out on Harry. Um, I would like to thank the board, the administration, and the entire staff for providing such an excellent learning environment for our students. I also had the privilege to serve on the Los Libos School Board for 10 years, acting as the president for four of those years. So I know firsthand how rewarding and, of course, challenging 
your job as a board member is often the only time you hear from your constituents is when we have a concern, and which is as it should be. That's part of the job description. However, today I am here to thank you. I know that the last year has been fraught with many challenges and you have been asked to handle unique difficulties that you could not have anticipated when you ran for election. As a taxpayer and as a parent, I would like to thank and commend you for your stewardship of the district. And I am profoundly grateful for your commitment to the personnel and the students of Santa Ynez Valley Union High School. Thanks, Sandy. Appreciate it. Yet sometimes we all wonder. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, go ahead, Terry. You have two to read. Yes, I have. I have two to read tonight. Uh, the first one is from Jillian Knight. County Board of, Edu of Education School Board member Michelle DeWord has been costing the San Ynez Valley Union High School District thousands for years. Through frivolous lawsuits dating back decades, Michelle DeWord has been suing the San Ynez Valley Union High School District and, is take and it's taking its toll financially. In the last few years, she has cost the district $54,682.24 for a public record request to the district from 2019 to present. Due to two prior lawsuits over the last 10 years and many hours are procured from meetings, complaints outside of lawsuits, individual sit-downs with administration and teachers as per her specific request, the remaining cost is pending as they tally it all up. The district has had to use four separate legal firms to handle these cases filed by Mrs. DeWord. Michelle DeWord was elected to the County Board of Education District Number 4 in 2020 and serves as chair of the San Ynez Valley Union High School Bond Measure K 2016 Citizens Oversight Committee, COC. On the main page of her website, which is Michelle the word for Santa Barbara County School Board.com, it states, I believe that fiscal, fiscally responsible and accountable decisions made today create a sustainable education system for future students. It seems as though that fiscal responsibility does not deter her from suing numerous times and costing the district tens of thousands of dollars. Where is this transparency? Transparency. How can we as a community trust someone like Michelle DeWord to oversee our expenditures on bond measure K when she's actively suing the district? At what point do we ask Mrs. DeWord to step down? Well, I think the time is now, and I also ask that the district consider not allowing her on campus other than as necessary for her current role on the county board, county education school board and COC to avoid any further lawsuits. I'm also asking for transparency as Mrs. DeWord's claims to want in her San Diego Valley Union High School Transparency Project Facebook group. Instead, her group has actively attacked teachers, allowed disparaging comments about board members and teachers, and promoted division within the community and district. Please take a stand and limit these costs by limiting district exposure from the sister group. Thank you, Jillian Knight. And the next one is from Robin Surslow. Dear board members, thank you for reopening the campus. You have been a leader in this area and I'm very grateful. As you have a very daunting task for replacing Mr. Corey, I hope that you will consider three things. First, I would love to see Mrs. Borges take on the role of superintendent principal as it was for years. She has done an outstanding job during a very difficult time. Perhaps this would free up money to add back woodshop or hire a school psychologist instead of using interns for mental health. Secondly, I hope that you use this opportunity to discuss possible sharing of resources with other Valley schools. There is at least one other school in the Valley that has a retiring principal, and it would be a wonderful time to discuss with all other Valley schools how we can work together to leverage funds and people. Perhaps there are job sharing or department sharing possibilities that would end up benefiting our kids. And lastly, I ask that that if you move forward with hiring an outside superintendent, that you please take politics out of the equation. In my lifetime, politics have never been part of public schools like they are now. I know you are facing a lot of pressure to put it politically minded, to put in politically minded person that even one of your board members has single signed a pledge to put his political ideology into the school curriculum. We need a bridge builder today more than ever. 
I hope that if you choose someone new, it will be someone that leaves their personal agenda at the door and is going to listen to all sides and do what is best for our students and our community. Let's come together as neighbors and friends and do what is best in the interest of our students. Thank you for your time and service. Sincerely, Robin Servitz, parent and alumni. Thank you, Terry. <coughs> All right. <coughs> Let's go on to item D, which is approval of the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Do I have a motion to? I so move. Thank you, Tori. And do I have a second? A second. All right, Jose Uh We have a motion and a second uh, to approve the consent agenda. Are there any discussion items? Yes, I have two questions. Uh, first is on the uh, warrants. Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, the first or purchase order. Uh, the first one on the list, chartered buses for varsity football, $6,000. What is that for? Is that for the season? Is that for a game? It is a blanket, yo. Um, Sorry, it's a blanket PO not to exceed that amount to cover buses necessary for the season. So it's not a guarantee that it will be used. Okay. It's an approval up to a set amount for however many buses would be needed for the season. Since the number of buses, the amount, where they're going, all that type of stuff wasn't known at the time of the PO, they just do blanket POs. Okay. All right. And the, uh, the other question I had was a warrant, and that was for... LaMata Internet Technologies for almost 50,000. Is that for internet service for the year or is that for, what is that for? Is no, that, I believe that was for a SQL server. Is it, do you have the warrant number? Do you see it? Uh, warrant number 01 uh -huh. 645 so that was the 29,000, yeah, that was, I believe the terminology for the piece of equipment is a SQL server. We had... I can chime in. Okay, sorry. It's the backup firewall. So it's it. our primary uh, piece of hardware that keeps us connected to the internet. And we only have one. So generally you want to have a backup so if the primary goes down, we can have a secondary ready to go. So then our kids aren't disconnected. And that's for 30,000? Yes, sir. What is the twenty thousand for? It's also the same number. It's nineteen thousand three hundred forty-two fifty. So, if you notice the codes next to it, so the twenty-nine thousand is the code is the cost next to the code forty-four hundred that denotes equipment. The fifty-eight hundred is it denotes services. So LaMata provides us with a number of services that we pay quarterly for. I believe in this check we're paying for three different quarterly services. One is a uh, quarterly service for security in the cloud. One is Microsoft licenses for all the students. I can't remember the, other, the third one. It's also the, the software that powers the firewall. Yeah, so we pay quarterly and we pay them all at the same time. So they, they're quite expensive. Do we, if we're gonna make a $30,000 expenditure for a backup firewall, do we put that up to bid or is that just a it's a uh, go with our tech guy. It's a uh, it's a piece of equipment that is specific to our school, so we can't go out and buy a, another brand one. It has to be the same brand that we already have. I, so our primary is about I think it was about fifty thousand, and the backup one. Is I don't think that that is answering what he's asking oh. for. So what what you're asking for is we have bid limits. This is below the threshold for the bid limit, so we don't do that. What we do do is use government contracts where. Any school, it's a number of schools in this cooperative purchasing agreement get a contract for a piece of equipment, and that contract is a contract that we piggyback on, which basically um, guarantees that we're getting the best price on the market at the time. But it does fall below the bid threshold where we have to go out for a formal bid. What is a bid threshold, you know, on top of your head? Um, it's different. So s services are... I want to say 58,000 and equipment is upwards of 94 or 84,000. So 
I can give you those limits specifically. I just don't have them. All. But we're pretty confident that this was a hundred percent confident. Yeah. Yes. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we have a motion uh, and a second to approve the consent agenda. Uh, Tor, uh, excuse me, Terry. This is a roll call. Mrs. Babcock. Aye. Mr. Luke. Aye. Mrs. Clevenger. Aye. Mr. Ibarra. Aye. Right, motion carries 4 0. Thank you. All right. <coughs> Moving right along uh, to item G, the action <coughs> agenda. Uh, number two, one to one student device technology proposal. Superintendent Corey. You bet. Thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, this is something that we've been building up to for a while. Uh, I provided a PowerPoint for all of you. I've got it up on the screen. And I just want to go through with you um, some of the reasons for um, the key reasons associated with a one-to-one -one student device environment for all of our kids. Um, and so let's just walk through a little bit about, about what our journey has been to date. Those of you in the audience, feel free to turn your chairs around and, and take, take a look at that. So as you all remember, March 13, 2020, on that fateful day, um, we were full-time in-person instruction. And then, oops, I'm back up there, a little sensitive. Um, on March 16th, um, just a few days later, we went to full-time distance learning for all students. One of the biggest instructional shifts ever experienced for anybody across the country to go from full-time in-person, the way we've always been doing it, to everything distance learning uh, just within a matter of, of days. It was really an amazing time, and here we are a year later. We were forced into a one-to-one -one device um, environment um, in terms of student use. We, while we certainly had some district devices, um, it was largely um, sustained by um, students and families with their own devices. And some of you in this room know the experience that you had where you were um, you know, arm wrestling for devices just to get work done and school done. And, having enough bandwidth and then all of those things. It was quite a challenge for all of our all of our families. For our staff, it was a forced professional development unlike any other. Um, you know, we had had, um, we didn't even know what Zoom was for the most part at that time. It is, it is now um, part of our vernacular. Um, but for our staff to make that change in such a short period of time um, was an incredibly heavy lift we never, ever could have anticipated. One of our biggest challenges, and everybody faced this across the country, was ensuring equal access for all of our students. And this, this really manifested itself in, in two different realms. Uh, one was that you have a device that can make it work, and two, that you have internet connectivity. Um, the internet connectivity we're able to um, address to some, in some regards um, by providing hotspots. Um, Rick, Ricky, do you know approximately how many hotspots we were able to well, over 100, sir. Yeah, and so the fact that we even got those during that time, by the way, when the rest of the country was looking for those was, was pretty amazing. Um, and then as far as actual number of devices, we'll, we'll see that number that we're actually able to get out um, to students. But making sure that there was equal access, um, you know, to extent an extent, we couldn't take care of all of those issues. And some of our families um, in, in more uh, remote locations didn't even, didn't even have um, access at all, uh, which really, really made it challenging. And so as a result of that, we launched several major initiatives, one of them uh, being obviously the distance learning itself and how do you teach and instruct and manage in an environment where everything is digital. Um, but we also kick-started our independent study program uh, with Tori Martinez as a teacher on special assignment um, and um, taking advantage of um, digital course offerings um, out at Refugio High School as well. So it has provided us with some opportunities to actually do some things that we otherwise never would have done. So if you're looking at some of those benefits of COVID, um, this is this is definitely part of that. And so, so really, as we looked at launching independent study um, concurrently with all the other digital learning that we had going on, as we as we knew coming out of COVID, there are going to be lots of other opportunities for us in the digital realm. Uh, that was a good way for us to, to dip our toes in that water there with um, actual digital online course offerings versus just the teacher instruction. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, what, what do we do in the post-COVID era, which we're entering into right now. 
Um, and then here is hoping that we will be able to be in person, every kid when we return in the fall. And so I just, this, this, that, my, my summary, the past year has seen us significantly modify and greatly enhance our use of technology. Everybody was doing it. That's a significant enhancement. The significant modification was, was how we were delivering instruction. And so with this now largely behind us, keep in mind we still have teachers this year that will finish this year in both hybrid and distance learning, which is a really challenging thing for our staff. But now that we've had this forced intensive professional development for this past year, how will we use that to redefine our instruction in the post-COVID era? Shame on us if we go back to the way we always did it. That would be a disservice to kids. That being said, moving forward, what is the service to kids that we want to provide um, in this particular realm? So just for the sake of the board, and I don't expect to capture all of this this evening, but in, in, in the realm of what does high quality technology integration look like? There are models for this out there, and, and this is actually one of them. And as you, as you look at that idea of substitution of um, you know, devices for instruction and even a modification. We've lived really heavily in those two realms and, and some teachers to an extent have engaged in modification, but really the, the last one with the R is that redefinition and how do we do and engage regularly in tasks that we've never engaged in before. That's the place that we really want to go for our, our students and their workforce is going to look more digital in terms of working remotely and how they perform those tasks in a digital environment. And so that, that idea of, of going from just merely an enhancement up there up top to transformation, we spent a lot of time in the enhancement realm and a little bit here, but how do we in, in the out years here next year and those years following get to that redefinition of what we're doing for students with technology? That's really the, the task before us. So let's talk about some of the benefits and lessons learned um, from technology that we've experienced over the last year. And there are a bunch of them. Uh, we have punched through the walls, the traditional walls of our, our classroom. Uh, we have the opportunity now with a multi-billion dollar digital learning environment now um, worldwide, not just locally, not just statewide, not just nationally, but worldwide. We can now offer our kids the world. Um, a smaller high school will have this opportunity to now to just explode our, our master schedule. Anytime learning obviously digitally happens anytime. We have students that have uh, issues with a regular model and schedule of high school. How do we better meet our student needs with that any concept of anytime learning? Uh, collaboration, much easier. One of the things that we've watched, and we'll get this to later too, in terms of parent involvement, we have watched parent involvement explode. That idea to be able to collaborate get rid of commutes and other things and bring people together. It's really been something um, that it, ability, even with students to digitally parse that out has really been something. Much more efficient in terms of how things are delivered, um, data collection. And we've really been experimenting with this a lot. We have a long way to go here. And then Michelle and company are doing some great, great work with this um, coming up next year and laying the groundwork for this right now. Um, how do we better collect data to engage in better formative instruction with our students, not just summit of where we do a post-mortem at the end of the year. How do we know along the way that we're doing the job that we need to do? Um, uh, the, the digital technology greatly helps us with that. Equity and access, if we get the right devices in the hands of all of our students, all kinds of barriers um, break down for our students, which is exa exactly where we wanted to be. One of the expenses that um, Mr. Luke had noted earlier was the idea of a um, having um, accounts in Microsoft Office 365 for all of our students. Every student has access, access to all of the Microsoft Office suites. It just helps ramp things up for all of our kids. Checking for understanding much quicker and easier for all students versus just one student at a time by virtue of raising a hand. Interactive learning, um, so many things out there to offer our kids to get them engaged. Creation of digital and analog, analog pro products, both. Um, in this world, variety of multimedia inputs and outputs, those are just developing all the time and that idea of parent engagement. If you talk to anybody in this room that's been running meetings with parents, um, every, everything from um, just a, a question and answer about a particular topic to a, um, a DLAC committee or anything um, in between, the 
number of parents that have been engaged as a result of being able to log into a Zoom meeting has been tremendously bolstered, and we've been really, really pleased with that. Okay, so some of the lessons learned along the way. Where do we need to go? So right up here at the top, as we move to the higher levels of this, it's called the SAMR model. Um, students move from consumers to creators, and the teacher role now, with so much access to all of this information from all over the world, and historically, now we go from just being, a, a, instead of just being an imparter of knowledge, where the teacher shares everything, to being a facilitator of that knowledge uh, with the use of technology. Okay. Michelle, are you going to say something there? No, I was just making sure you're saying everything. Okay, that's all good. That's all good. <laughs> all right. So, what is what is our what is our current status? What have we achieved so far to date that's going to set the stage for the future? Um, significant steps already taken. We mentioned the Office 365 for every student, um, the use of Canvas, which is our learning management system, our LMS, um, has been put on steroids. One of the favorite comments I heard from a teacher who didn't know I heard him say it was, "Hey." Before we went to distance learning, I thought I was pretty good with Canvas. Now I've learned so much, I'm never going back to the way I used to do it. That's what you want to hear. That's, that's that exciting moment um, that you hear that from staff saying, hey, I'm better doing it this way. It's better for my kids. How old was the teacher? Um, <laughs> wow, is it okay to, to make that guess? Uh, approaching middle age. How, how's that? And then from an assessment perspective and what we're doing with our students with online assessments, and of course, what we've been doing with state assessments, but one of the initiatives that we're working very hard on right now um, is what are we doing, again, for those um, formative assessments throughout the year um, with things like STAR math and reading, and you'll hear more about that um, from Michelle in the very near future. And of course, Edgenuity uh, with the digital online course offerings, particularly out of Refugia right now, but also for our independent study exclusively all web-based, okay? So we have out, and Ricky, you can check my facts on this, um, but I think I got all this from you, 150 Surface Go devices to students that were actually able to purchase, uh, thanks to Ricky's timing and jumping on that right away because it's just a few weeks later, those were not available. Um, and another 100 miscellaneous devices out to students that we have checked out to our students to allow them to, to access all the, all the distance learning. Okay, and again, hybrid and distance learning still occurring. Uh, we are planning for full-time in-person. That is our trajectory right now. And it's so exciting to even be able to say that um, to start the 21-22 school year. Our classrooms have been upgraded, um, and this is, Ricky has been living this dream. And by the way, let me, let me introduce the team that's here tonight, by the way. I'm so sorry for not doing that up front. Ricky Hernandez is the head of our IT. It's, um, Talk about a time to be on point with technology. <laughs> he, got, he jumped into it at just the right time to be an IT manager. That's off to you. Uh, but we also have Michelle Borges at the San Jose High School principal of making all of this happen on the San Jose High campus. Um, Claudia obviously has been a part of our leadership team too, more on the health and the wellness side. Uh, but the um, and then Tori Martinez on the um, independent study side and being a huge assist with all things digital learning in general. Um, can't thank them enough. So I asked them to be here tonight as well in case there's any questions from the board. So I'm um, sorry for not getting to that earlier. So the last bullet here, the use of personal student devices is creating for us from a management standpoint. And Ricky, I'll just give you 60 seconds on this if you wouldn't mind in terms of creating roadblocks for us because we do have a lot of student devices on campus, but even managing off-campus access to our systems. Can you skip 60 seconds, please? Yeah, so in terms of the devices that are on campus, we have kids showing up with their personal computers who are trying to connect to our network, and there are times when they can't get on, and then we, we do a diagnose on the machine, and the machine is either riddled with viruses or something else is wrong with it, whereas if we had our own devices, then we could manage them, we could manage the updates, we could make sure that the system was running correctly. Today I was in a um, freshman focus class, and um, I was being interviewed by the kids, and I noticed that there was a lot of different devices on there, and you can see that some kids who could afford really nice devices had their really nice device there, and other kids that couldn't either had one of our devices or they had something that was just not adequate. Yeah. And how about from a network security I standpoint? Was say, was gonna Correct. So you could have um, kids show up with a device that's infected that could potentially infect other computers that are on the same network. Slow things down. There's a lot of variables when you 
have a bring your own device environment. And there's less control. So we can't filter a lot of the stuff that kids could potentially be exposed to. Okay. And it doesn't bog down our system. So if we're able to have our own Wi-Fi and only let our school devices onto that Wi-Fi, so you don't want a kid in the classroom could have their watch, their their person, their phone, and their computer all bogging up our system. Yeah. Like, so and right now we can't shut it down because we need them to have that access. Yeah. Like, so until we have our own device. One student could potentially take five network connections. They could have an Apple Watch. They could have an iPhone. They could have their laptop. They can have something else, so it's, I'm hearing Apple might make glasses coming up soon. <laughs> so that's another thing that's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And let's let's talk about what the need is. You just heard a little bit of that, so we'll use that as our segue for moving ahead here. Um, before we do anything, if we're going to make the decision to go to a one-to-one -one device environment, we must have, we're going to be successful with it another tech position. And so you'll actually see that it, depending on how this vote goes here about a one-to-one -one proposal, uh, without the tech support to help manage all of those devices, I would not recommend um, going to a one-to-one -one device environment just because the amount of work associated with that. We have Ricky and Hector already, our, our, our two IT guys, are already maxed out and tapped. If we had one device for every student and try to manage all the classroom manifestations of that, it won't, it won't happen well. I mean, we, we do need to set this up for, for success. So two primary failures for any one -to one device implementation. First is professional development, followed almost immediately by tech support. Um, you can even put those in tandem if you want, but if you don't have the infrastructure and the IT support to make that happen, and the teacher training to make an effective use and not just a, you know, a, a $1,800 uh, pencil, then you've really um, engaged in the implementation in the wrong way. Okay, so that's the that's the first um, first recommendation. District provided devices for all students. Um, and again, some of the reasons we just talked about: tech management, um, equity, security, all of those things. If we own the devices, we have the controls, and we, we can custom tailor those just for instructional purposes on campuses. It needs to be um, customized. Okay, network improvements, and some of these are already in place, and we haven't done all of them because you can't shut everything down and do the work that we need to do while we're still accessing the network to such a large extent for instruction. So we are already in the process of working on replacement of old switches um, to increase that capacity and reliability, um, and then also um, a, redesign, a redesign of our um, Wi-Fi access control on campus. I think um, Ricky and his, his team um, have done the best they can to to keep things running, but if we're going to be in a very robust use environment with the one-to-one, -one, um, we need to, to wrap some of this stuff up. And a lot of this work will have to happen this summer because there will be um, extended shutdowns of the, of the Wi-Fi. Um, but if we're going to be ready and as bulletproof as we possibly can, um, when students arrive in the fall, we need to make sure that um, that network infrastructure is, is ready May to go. May I ask a question, Scott? Oh, certainly. I, I don't you didn't have your mask against your mouth moving. I'm like, who? Who is that? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I, I'm just curious because I, I remember reading that LA Unified had difficulty when they kind of had dip, you know, rolling these things out a, a while back. My question is replacement costs for the devices. What can we we budget for that? Was, Ricky, do you know what that would run us? I mean, I'm assuming something's going to get damaged or lost, and parents, yeah. I don't know, parents can <laughs> electronic devices with high school students. Something's going to yeah, happen. something like that. Right? I, I will. I will let Lisa answer that. She, we've been working on this. We've been. Apple to, to Microsoft products. Apples to oranges. Apples to oranges. Yeah. Almost said apples to oranges. Yeah. Apples so, to apples. In the process of looking over the financials, we are looking at lease options where we are recycling, well, not recycling, but renewing devices every freshman class after the initial buying every four years. Well, okay, I'm not explaining this right. We will buy devices for every student this year. And we're looking to do that on a lease contract where we pay one-fourth of that cost for the next 40 years. Included in the lease is insurance for the device. So if anything happens, they take care of it so it's no extra cost. As well as we are looking for 0% financing. So we don't want interest and in all that kind of stuff. So we're looking for those two options within the contract. Those first set of devices will work for four years. We are going to, I think, extend one 
we class talked about two, we talked about two class sets for an extra students. year or two. So we'll give all of our students next year advice. The seniors turn will turn get yeah, the seniors will turn theirs in and they will go to the next year's freshmen as the juniors will turn theirs in and they will go to the next year's seniors. After that, we will buy about 250 devices every year for the new freshman class. So it will be approximately one fourth of the cost of the initial purchase. So from the point out to the sophomores, <clears throat> basically, so like the sophomores this next year, which are freshmen this year, they will receive a device and those students will graduate with that device and take the college with them. We're not giving it to the junior see it as a brand new skill. You know, we don't want to give them a brand new device, you know, one year out and be able to take it with them. There's also the idea that you add a lease fee to it, you know, like a 20 minimal. So by the time they leave, it's not a gift of public funds. So there's also that piece of it that you have to incorporate in there. So yes. The ones that are going to get the biggest bang for their buck are going to be the sophomores, obviously. But from that point on, every other group of students as they come in gets a four-year device, except for when we rotate that senior one and the junior ones, they'll probably have like the you know the older ones. Five, yeah. You know, so five, they're going to have the worst end of the deal. Our sophomores are going to have the best end of the deal, and then after that, it will be we'll be on a cycle of students coming into freshman year. We'll also incentivize our kids to take care take of the care device. Of so yes. we give you a device. Your freshman, you're going to keep that for four years. And if you take care of it, you can use that in college, which is pretty awesome. Oh, okay. That that makes sense because yeah. I have visions of parents. You know, if I have a sophomore son, God forbid, what that what would happen? You know, losing it a couple of times a year, and then the cost would be borne by the parents, and that might not be terribly popular. It's actually really yeah. I experienced it for the last four years of my career, so it actually surprisingly, I think the kids you know, the, the kids do a great job with their devices. Oh, okay. I mean. They'll have a connection to their social world. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a part of who they are. Now. Yes. Yes. No different than them spilling a soda in a bag full of textbooks that cost $150 each, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's a good quote. Remember that analog digital thing? You just got one of those back there. So that was, that was great. Are there other questions? speak just that a little yeah, bit too. We're, we're, we're severely understaffed sir we have we we help run the learning management system we, we run almost all the systems between two people other school districts our size have four or five people they're big departments yep they've been picking up a lot of the some of the, the software or platform management as well mm -hmm. um, which has been significant we're so. involved in testing we're involved we're involved in everything Yep. And, and then as we get more and more software, you know, so we adopted Pear Deck this year. Um, and as we go into one, we're going to adopt more and more, you know, like Desmos and, and, and several other things that they're going to have to help us manage um, in that process as well. Anything else on that, Steve? So, yes, but I forgot. I'll come back. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Okay. So additional tech staff, district provided devices, network improvements, and the last one, which you've already alluded to, which is professional development, um, both from a technical expertise um, and how, how do the teachers actually work the devices. This is also something that the IT staff is heavily involved in. Um, and then that instructional support comes from instructional leadership team. How do we effectively and fully implement the, the devices? And that's just, that's just a, an ongoing loop that never never goes away for, for staff. Okay, that's the need that we currently see. Those four points um, are at the, the tip of the spear for our implementation. So let's talk a little bit about the funding pieces. As Alicia alluded to, we're looking at a four-year financing plan. Um, we're asking the board for a not to exceed amount of two hundred fifty thousand per year for the first four years. Um, just for a note for the board, we'll be talking more about this, but years one and two um, can be funded by what's called the ex Expanded Learning Opportunity and In-Person Instruction Grant, shortened to ELO. And those of you from the 70s, 80s remember ELO, let that go. Um, I, I saw it in my head that just won't go away. Um, so 
we, we will be a receipt of um, north of $900,000 in funds, um, and we can expend those funds on devices as well for um, expanded learning opportunities for our students. And we will be recommending that we use um, enough of those funds to cover the first two years. Um, we have to expend that um, ELO money um, by December of 22. How did I do? You did December great. of 22. That was a lot of pressure. You did great. Thank the you. other option, we went out looking for a four year lease option. And that is the reason that only the first two years could be covered by this grant that Scott was just telling you about. If we were to change the terms of the lease and ask them to chop it up over two years, we could potentially access more of those grant funds to make this purchase. We have the flexibility to do that if that makes people more comfortable. And so I, I would, um, I'll push against it just a little bit and recommend against that just because there are other immediate needs that we have in regards to student learning in terms of staffing that the balance of those funds can actually cover. I, I, I think from an instructional standpoint, feel free to, you know, yeah, definitely looking at go back and forth on that at all. But um, there, there are some staffing needs that we have the next couple of years that will be funded by those, those okay. monies as well. Yeah. Yeah. Having lots of conversations in the last two weeks, I've been spending a lot of time with um, state level AXA and legislators and with the, the um, and, and what it's going to look like to open next year and how we um, accelerate learning when we come back next year um, and, and provide the interventions to uh, catch students up. When they talk about learning loss, I'm not real comfortable with saying we lost learning because you didn't, you can't lose something you didn't have. So it's more about we slowed down and now we have to speed them back up and catch them up to where they were. So in these discussions, it's really about how are we using that funding to support that learning and you know we're going to math is the biggest hit and we need you know some math intervention specialists to help us get into next year we're going to need some english intervention with reading to really get some things started um and and you know we've got some things already rolling that i, I, think, I don't want to step on toes for next meeting but no that's okay. fine no okay. go ahead i, I think it's where you're going with this okay yeah we're because, talking about uh, a lot we, you know with temporary position or whatever it may be you know for the next two years to really roll our sleeves up and help our kids instructionally um and especially in the math and english area that's that's going to be our biggest thing for our buck with using some of this funding um and you know and and we have like right now we have an extra staff member in the english department that's helping out Fortunately, she's free right now to do a lot of work for us, and it's really, you know, doing a great job getting us set up for that stage for next year, and then we're able to have another staff, maintain another staff and right person in that department and get a half person, and we, we're going to do some rock star stuff next year, and we've got some other plans for professional development that is going to be exciting coming up, within the, even in, as early as, not next Monday, but the following Monday, yep. that's going to happen in that it's already, already laying that groundwork right now. right now, yeah, which is exciting. Okay. It is exciting. Yeah. Really. With, with solution trade, if you're familiar with them, with DeVore and, and the, the whole PLC stuff. And um, so really exciting stuff with you know, communications that I'm having to build some kids for growth and getting our kids where they need to be next year. So in talking about funding for the computers, good sounds like good news. What about for the students? Who need to use it in the evenings at home? Who don't have internet service? Hotspots. What? How do we address we that? We provide hotspots for them, sir. They will have hotspots. Yes, we already have those hotspots. We own those, correct? Mm -hmm. yes. We do. We, we, we just have the, the annual connectivity, which is it's priced low for education, so it's not huge. Awesome. Yeah. So and, they would and, be able and, to use these at home. Yeah, and those yep. hotspots have filters on them, so they can't access inappropriate sites. Excellent. Even better. Thank yeah. You. So there, there are just a handful, and I don't know if you can help me on a number. There are some students that live in very remote places where even those hotspots don't work. But for the majority, the hotspots are the are the answer for what you're talking about. Yeah. And that was actually today. I was on the national. I've been on a lot of meetings. Um, Sacramento Monday and Tuesday, and then last Monday and Tuesday, and then today I was on the national uh, secondary uh, school principals uh, conference, and and the you know the you know the um, advocacy piece of it, and talking, and actually um, the U.S. Uh, Secretary of, of Education uh, Miguel Cardona was on today, so it was really exciting this morning, 
And a big piece of the conversation was he was asking, what do you need? And one of the things was we need our kids to have access. And, and that was a big piece of the conversation along with, um, you know, things like, you know, connect, you know, connections to colleges and, and mental health and technology. And uh, there was a lot of, a lot of good things that they're saying, what do you guys need for next year? Wanting to fully open, make sure that we fully open, make sure that distance learning does not look like distance learning looks this year. So a lot of really good conversations have been had with the, within the last two weeks. And there is a significant recognition at the state and federal level um, that um, there are students a huge disservice um, because there wasn't equal access to internet. And so there is both federal and state funding and initiatives to, uh, to bring that to the forefront. So that's been greatly accelerated. Still a ways off, but it's been greatly accelerated. Okay. And we leave the library open. You know, we'll leave the library open for kids that say, when I get home, I don't have, it's, it's a little spotty for me. So we find ways to help them during the school day or right after school too. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so years one and two funded by the ELO grants, years three and four funded by the general fund. And in talking um, with Elysia about those out years, uh, we believe that we'll be in a, in a comfortable spot to, to make that comfortable. Is that the right word? We can make it work. We can make it work. Yes, we can. <laughs> okay. Year five and beyond, which was alluded to earlier, uh, maintenance replacement of one grade level each year, that being the incoming ninth graders at approximately 59K a year based on current pricing. Okay, so we have that initial 250 for four years, two of those years being paid for out of yellow grant. We pick up the other 250 for the years three and four, and then the maintenance of um, roughly $59,000 per year um, for those new freshmen, assuming about 250 freshmen, which is about right. We will, we will be back up to a thousand kids in another couple of years, sir. Yeah, our numbers, our freshman numbers are pretty, are spiking. Yeah. We're going to be taking back, we're be taking back up. Yeah. And, and just for those of you who don't know, our, our district has been, if you look back 20, almost 25 years, north or south of a thousand students. And it just, it, it's cyclical, you know, 1100 down to 900, we're 850 right now, and a little extra dip with the whole COVID thing. But that's a nationwide um, trend as well. But the population of the valley in the meantime has just been going up, up, up. And where we've been dropping enrollment, so I hope that's the yeah. Freshman number is increased going. significantly from okay. last year's freshman. Yeah. The ones that are coming, the eighth graders that are coming in right now. Yeah. We're so we, we anticipate, yeah, we anticipate another two or three years being back up a thousand. Right. Yeah. Right. So all good. Okay, and the last and final cost was the IT support engineer one FTE that we talked about, and that is the cost depending on where they fall on the salary schedule between sixty-one and eighty-five thousand, and that's been vetted through Lisi as well in terms of budget building right now, which is needy been. And keep in mind budget cycles, what we've always planned for uh, current year and then two out years. So we should look three years out now from this point, uh, we are we are good at this point. Okay. All right, the timeline. Um, if given approval from the board, um, order student devices, ASAP, obviously there's lots of competition for them out there. Um, hiring and training of additional staff, uh, tech staff member, um, I would ask for an immediate um, high opening of that position um, so we can front load that person to be ready um, for if we are a one-to-one -one device um, environment next year, the summer work will be Mount Everest. Is that an accurate way to put that, Mr. Hernandez? Yes. Sir. yes. <laughs> so it's really for the preservation of his sanity. Um, summer prep of student devices, as we were just talking about, that's a, that's a huge amount of work there. Um, deployment of those devices in August of 2021. And then the staff PD uh, professional development um, start well yeah, starting in August of 2021 and beyond again. Um, how do we you know, identify those needs and priorities and then implement? Uh, one of the things that we're finding as we look at planning for next year is that there's way more awesome stuff that we want to do and we have time to do it. And so we're working on that prioritization, but it's an exciting place to be. Okay. Any questions on the timeline? Okay. That All is right. it, unless there are any other questions. No questions. Uh, so, item two, one-to-one <laughs> -one student device technology proposal. Do I have a motion to approve the proposal? I motion. Okay, Steve. Do I have a second? I second. Let's say one. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the one-to-one -one student device technology proposal. <laughs> Terry, roll call, please. Mrs. Babcock. Aye. Mr. Luke. Aye. Mrs. Clevenger. Aye. Mr. Abaro. Aye. Motion carries 4-0. Thank you very much, Thank everyone, you. for your work. Yippee skippy, now we really start working. <laughs>
So we just did something really fantastic for our kids. We just did something really fantastic for our students. And so for the work that's already been done by the team, for the work that you are about to do. Thank you all very much. But shame on us if we miss this opportunity and we see that. So thank you all. And I will say that he did forget to mention a member of our team, which was speaking earlier, Alicia. So <laughs> she's she's pretty important when it comes to this. Okay. Yeah. She's gonna yeah. keep us in line and find those best proposals for us. And she did she did me a solid for this Apple Mac lover person here. So that's great. That's great. So, All right, let's so move on to item number uh, three, which is new classified position and job description, IT support engineer one. Um, we have approved the uh, proposal. And then uh, this is, a, I guess, a second piece to it. So um, do I have, we don't need an explanation here. So I don't think there. so, unless there's questions. Yeah, can I have sure. a question? I, I was going to say this comment for the end of the meeting, so maybe I can tie it in here. As a parent of the school for the last five years, uh, I've had opportunities to drop my kids off for sports practices or events in the evening. And before they were driving, I'd cool my heels and uh, wait for the practice to finish so I could take them home. And walking the campus at night, the soccer field lit up. Kids out there practicing, playing games. Both gyms lit up. Tennis courts lit up. Pool activities going on. Except for Wednesday night, the library is dark. And I, I know there are kids, especially freshmen and sophomores, who aren't driving yet, who are on JV teams, who, aren't, who are, have to wait. To not when school ends, they have a couple hours before they can get on the court, the field, or the pool. They don't have rides home. El Rancho, I guess, is the next best option. I think it'd be incredible if we had this library open longer, um, especially into the evening. I, I, we do the uh, Wednesday night tutorial. I know it's sparsely attended, sadly. I, uh, the teachers who staff it, Mr. Bixler especially, I mean, they, they do yeoman's work for peanuts, but I'm wondering if maybe we if three IT persons, is, could one just be sitting at the desk getting work done quietly? Absolutely. Having the lights on door open to any students want to do. Yeah. Okay. I would love I would love to be here to help the kids out with any issues after school. Absolutely. Really? We I think that would be a win win. win. We can make it work. One of the staff would come in yeah. late Later one day and stay yeah. late to be with the kids. Absolutely. Great. Wonderful suggestion. Yes. Great. I appreciate that. All right. <clears throat> All right, so do I have a motion to approve the new classified position and job description IT support engineer one? So moved. All right, do I have a second? Second. All right, Steve. A motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All right. Terry? Mrs. Babcock. Aye. Mr. Luke. Aye. Mrs. Clevenger. Aye. Mr. Ibarra. Aye. Motion carries 4 0. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again. Yes. yes. Party. Yes. All right. Let's move on to something really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Item four. Sorry, solution. Yeah, here we go. Sorry. Sorry, I know. Resolution to establish good stuff. Yeah. Resolution to establish a county school facilities fund fund 35. Alicia, take it away. So exciting, guys. So we're receiving Prop 51 funds. In order to legally receive those funds, they have to be put into this designated fund, Fund 35, keep them separate from other funds and other fiscal reporting. So it is just a matter of legal requirement that we create this fund in order to receive the Prop 51 funds that should be here sometime towards the end of this fiscal year. In the fall, yep, yeah. sometime midly fall. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution to establish a county schools facility fund, Fund 35. Do you have a second? Second. Right. Jose, one, perfect. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All right, roll call, Terry. Mrs. Babcock. Aye. Mr. Luke. Aye. Mrs. Clevenger. Aye. Mr. Ibarra. Aye. Motion carries 4 0. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. And just to take a moment and celebrate, too, we've been working on receipt of these funds um, since Major K passed. And so the fact that we are actually going to be in receipt of um, 6.4 million bucks and another 1.3 waiting for a future state bond um, is, is something that um, is going to allow us to do some good things, some great things for kids. So um, it's great to be in this spot. So. All right. All right. We're moving on to item H, discussion. And number two, facilities prioritization, Proposition 51 expenditure. 
Superintendent Corey. You betcha. Um, and Lisa Palmer. Palmer is here as a guest from the San Andreas Valley Community Aquatics Foundation. Thanks so much for being here, Lisa. Um, I would like to say that the, some of the backup materials um, that um, were in the, uh, the associated with the agenda have been modified, and I want to hand those out. And if anybody in the public uh, wishes to, um, to be just a minute to do this, um, I will get you copies. Um, go ahead and get rid of that one. Just my note. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, keep the notes that just uh, go with you. Oh, I thought I got one. Too. Are you interested? Sure. Okay. Anybody else in the public interested yeah. in seeing any of these at all? Okay. You are. You read it. That's because you're that kind of person. I love you for that. All right. So uh, the top sheet um, is a summary, and uh, we'll, we'll let um, Lisa. Do you have current? to so make sure we've got the same thing, just in case. Lisa, would you like to come up to the podium and if you, uh, sure. sure, rather than the back of the room. Yeah, this is Thanks, Lisa. Uh, and by the way, since we do have people here in person for the first time, if I may pause for just a second, um, our school resource deputy, Joe Parker, in the back there has been a tremendous yeah. asset to this campus. He is a kid guy. He's out there getting to know students, mingling with students, and it's been more help than I can possibly tell you. So he's been a great addition. So Joe, thanks for being here. And a parent. Sure. Yeah. And a parent as well. Yes. So great, great stuff. So 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 pleased to have him. So um, let's take a look at these three documents that are in front of you. We've been having a conversation um, up until now about the idea of we have these Prop 51 funds that are coming in, what do we do with those funds? One of the um, primary points of this conversation has been the status of our pool. Um, we've been talking about not just the pool, but also locker rooms and the theater has recently come up as well. And so uh, we have been working on costs associated with in particular the pool. Um, and also a key component of this has been the um, engagement and involvement of and partnering with um, the Senate Valley Community Aquatics Foundation, um, here to, or referred to as the foundation. Um, and so uh, that's why Lisa is here as well, keeping in mind that uh, we have a significant need to um, significantly repair or even replace our current pool. Um, but there is also an opportunity um, by partnering with the foundation to um, provide even more for our community, not just our students, but also all members of our community and provide um, aquatics programming. And so I want to talk about a couple of the, um, the shifts in funding. And um, Lisa, I'll let you, if you, if you want to, do you want to start with, with the documents at all, or would you like me to? I, I, my idea, I think, why don't you lead and I'll okay. do color commentary. Yeah, no, no, no. That, that, that sounds that sounds great. So, um, what I would like to do is is talk about the construction numbers associated with um, a pool on our own. So we decide, hey, we're not partnering with the foundation. What does it cost to make that happen on our own? What happens if we partner with the foundation? What are some of the implications of of those um, of those um, things there? So. Let's take a look at um, the sheet that has uh, that was the top sheet for you um, that looks just like this one here. And again, the other two sheets from 196, our architects are just supporting um, supporting numbers for your reference. And uh, this is a discussion this evening, not asking anybody to make any decisions. Um, and I would ask you, after you hear about all of this, I would love to have um, uh, entertain all of your questions. And, and we're going to continue this conversation in May. So, Let's take a look at this. So the first line in yellow there, if we um, were to replace our pool a, with a 33 meter pool, and, and it's a, just a standard um, concrete gunite, um, no Murtha components, the cost for replacing that based on preliminary numbers, keep in mind, 
This has been generated by our architects. A logical next step um, would be to actually hire a construction estimator to see what is the disparity, if any, between an architect and also construction estimator to see how, um, how firm these numbers are. But the cost um, based on 196's um, uh, interpretation of, of what those would currently be, um, actually not currently looking out to 2023, because we would not construct until 2023. So let me review that really quick. Why so far out? So if, the, if, if we got the green light, let's say that happens in June, if we decide in May, even better. But let's say that we decided in June to move ahead with a um, replacement of the pool. It would take four to five months to create the plan set, submit that to the division of the state architect. It would take six to nine months to do the back and forth of the review of those plan sets. And then once we had approved or what's called stamp, stamped plans, it's a feedback from her mic up here. Um, once we have those plans, then we have approximately six to eight weeks to go out to bid, secure the bidders, mobilize the, the resources and actually start construction. It would be spring of 23. So as you look at these calculations and those columns, you'll see all the way to the far right on the 196 documents, 2023, because there is rather substantial escalation that we incur over that period of time. So that's really important to know. So construction costs today are not even close to the same to what they would be in 2023. So that, that's really important. You can see those percentages in there as well. So utilizing all that background there to replace the pool on our own, um, no, no association with the foundation, $8.8 .8 million, which we do not have. If we link arms with the foundation, and this is just from a practical funding standpoint, the district portion of a tool pool complex because of some economies and scale and some other things that occur now becomes 7.1, which we theoretically could afford. We can talk more about that later. So replacing on our own, based on the numbers we have right now, we cannot afford that. See you, Ella, thank you. Based on a, a partnership with the foundation, 7.1, we could afford. And then you look at what the assets are under the blue bar there that the foundation actually brings to the table. Um, and some of those, um, those, the value of those assets um, actually help bring us down from the 8.8 .8 to the 7.1. Lisa, anything that you want to say about any of that? Yeah, if I could first, thank you. Um, I just wanted to point out, we the board was uh, kind enough to appoint an ad hoc committee to thank you. work with the foundation on this. It is President Clevenger and Mr. Ibarra, so thank you. But I did, we had a very productive, what I thought was a very productive meeting last week. I do want to point out what you have today in front of you is different than what we talked about. So uh, Mr. Corey and I had a conversation with 19.6 on Monday. If I can be telling you what you already know, then I'll, I'll speed it along. But I, I think it's important just from a transparency standpoint that, you know, it's like every time we talk to Alan, the, uh, you know, there seems to be an escalation. So these, these figures before you today have been updated since we met and reflect that escalation. And also an adjustment in the cost savings on a project proportion basis. Mm -hmm. So not to get into the weeds. But and he had originally calculated just to 2022, which was not accurate. So we, right. won't be, we won't be constructing. Even the best case scenario, we're not constructing in 2022. So it was already in an additional, this is more than a 5%. It's closer to a 10% Correct. overall than what we presented. And that's just a function of, of the... Um, of the, uh, you know, the cost of materials and, you know, time cost of money. Can you hear me? Can Your mic, there's a little switch to toggle over on the top. It's just talking right into it. Yeah, yeah, it's so awkward. But other than that, these costs are, um, as, as we discussed, I think it is important the, the MRSA valuation in the district portion is significant. I mean, that's a 1.3 plus the project cost, the installation uh, cost. That's a, um, you know, it's a 1.6 loaded delta, if you would. Um, for 
from the foundation side, you know, all of our assets that we have, or assets and funds we've raised, have been predicated on moving forward with the community to to pool complex. So, you know, that's the charter of the foundation. That's the basis on which we've been working now for more than five years. Um, not that that means uh, we have to pursue this, but I'm just, you know, the, the funds that we are committed to bring and help to realize this, you know, essentially leveraging a need that you already have to replace the existing pool. You know, if you if you look at the map with the foundation's um, participation in those assets, uh, you know, your your overall spend on replacing your pool is reduced by I think 1.6, 1.7, and we get two pools um, out of out of that instead of one replacement. So. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is we there is a, an ad hoc committee with the city of Gilton. Um, you know we we had a, a joint use structure in place as part of the Prop 68 uh, exercise we went through last year. Unfortunately, we weren't successful in obtaining that grant. However, what it did do was create a, a joint use structure between the districts, uh, the city of Gilton as the programming operator and the foundation as a nonprofit element to help, help with both the fundraising for the capital part of this as well as potential ongoing uh, programming. So instead of ditching that because of Prop 68, we have revised that. Uh, the ad hoc committee has that uh, through review. Um, the city of Gilton is reviewing that because if I'm sitting in your shoes and I used to serve with Sandy on our school board. You know, there's a, there's the, the project cost, the capital cost, but then what about the ongoing, um, you know, operations and maintenance and programming piece of it? So, um, you know, the the not to get too into the weeds, and maybe you want to ask questions, but that that MOU provides for a structure, the joint use committee, that can um, negotiate, if you will, and set any pass through usage fees. You know, if there is uh, ongoing operating, operating, operating and maintenance costs that we find that aren't aligned with the, the, what the district budget should look like, you know, there's an, my point is there's an opportunity amongst those three organizations to have, have an ongoing conversation to set, you know, a budget or address issues. Um, and, and that model has worked very well uh, with, it within the city of Gilton and their joint use arrangement between uh, City and rec department in the school district. So, anyway, I've said. Could I ask a quick question, sure. if I may? Uh, could you tell me, do you, is the aquatic does it? Right. Does the aquatics group? Uh, are you finished with your fundraising, or do you still have more? Are you confident that you'll have enough? Well, here's what I can tell you: is clearly, well, first of all, the dynamic has changed significantly since we started this effort, and the district has funds to contribute that we, when we started. Uh, we, we, we didn't. Um, I, I do see, based on these costs, um, you know, there's still about one and a half million. If we were to go our, you know, the community portion and the district portion that the foundation would uh, look to fundraise for. But I think with a commitment from the district in hand and a deadline, um, I, I'm confident we can do that. And the other piece of that is we do have the funds in hand to get us through the permitting, right? So that joint permitting and processing piece is key, and we have the funds in hand to make sure that happens while we wrap up, you know, a million, give or take, to, to meet the construction needs. So that, that's actually a great point. So uh, we've had lots of conversations about this, that if we decide, hey, we're in, go fundraise, they have enough, we're going to create the plan sets for both our pool and their pool. They have enough to see that process through to its conclusion with the understanding that if they weren't successful with the fundraising, that that's, you've got a really expensive, you know, stack of paper now um, that would just have to be for some something possibly down the road. But we can, we can link arms with plan sets, get all of those done and ready for submittal um, again, which would be, you know, we'd, we'd be four to five months out from, from June. I'm um, we'll getting that raised. So it would be fall sometime before we would submit to DSA. And then there would be a significant back and forth. So they'd have a period of about 10 to 12 months to raise those funds. And we do have a very generous community. And you guys worked really hard. So 
appreciate that. I just want to hear that you were optimistic. Right? Absolutely. I mean, if you think again where we come from, we need another seven million versus we've got a deal and we need to close the gap of a million. We've, we've talked to folks already. And, you know, I don't want to over promise, but I think based on um, our conversations and the commitments we have so far, that we would within, within a year be able to close that. Story. Thanks, Lisa. I appreciate it. And Lisa, uh, my understanding is that um, the and this is part of, I believe, the um, in the MOU or whatever with the dis between the district and and the foundation mm -hmm. that um, the costs that are coming from the foundation would also cover the parking lot. Correct. So, so if you look, and I think there's a plan that, that is on the 1960. Yeah, so and that is that is. Included in the foundation or the, the community Con portion of the project. So, because of how we reconfigure and take up some of that parking adjacent, you know, on the east side of the old gym, uh, that plan and that cost uh, is included in the community portion. So, we have a reconfigured entrance on that east side. So, you know, we're able to have some. Uh, I don't want to say division, but be able to have security and joint use during the school day, right? So the campus is secure, but there's still uh, public access to the community portion of the pool. And then picking up to the south, right? Some just by, by redoing and reconfiguring that lot, now I'm not talking to the mic, sorry. Uh, we pick up the, the spaces that we lose by using that real estate. Yeah. We have 37 spaces that we lose adjacent to the old gym, and so we would be able to recreate and actually recapture 37 spaces by extending, and that, that is, again, you'll see it, that's specifically called out the cost sheet from 1906. Okay. And one other question, and that is, um, so the Mirtha pools have been sitting for a few <clears throat> years, all right, um, and my question or concern is, um, you know, are they functional? Uh, and or is it going to be a surprise that oh can okay, we did it and now the Mirtha pools are not no, it's working? A that good question. And we actually had this conversation yesterday. I mean, the stainless steel. I mean, the bulk of the pool, all of those components that make up the um, you know the, the lining, if you will, mm -hmm. of the pool, are you know those the, the life on those is I don't, know, I don't want to overcommit, but it's like upwards of fifty years. In that, so what we would need to do is there's some, I don't even know what you want to call it, but like the equivalent of weather stripping, right? Mm -hmm. There's there are going to be some components and some related to the pump that we need to replace. But an examination of, of the assets, both the, the panels for the pool, the, the pump is on site, right? Um, and just making sure that those are all um, yeah, in working order. So, and I think, again, that would be part of our announcement. We just we haven't opened them until we have a reason to go on and start just you know, really getting to the next level of detail. But so, but overall, the stainless steel is in working order and we'll have to assess those pieces. And that, that would, you know, it's the foundation outside. I totally expect that we'll be on the to figure out how to replace those parts or work a deal out with Martha to get those as needed. Great. So these estimates, the 8.8 .8 and the 7.1 with the contribution, those pool only, and then we parking, locker rooms. Does that include the demo? So yes, it's yeah. it's it's yes, it's from from demo to completion. That includes you'll see the light items for decking and all yes, okay. all, all associated costs to complete construction. But seating, parking, locker rooms is that in so addition? locker rooms? No, there would be a separate. Go ahead. So for the community portion, so there's the uh, five lane pool. There would be a essentially a restroom. I think it includes two to three. I have to, uh, basically, you know, uh, individual use, family use type restrooms. So unisex uh, restrooms. And then we would have a row of outdoor showers, external, like on the deck. And that would that would be it. And then the parking lot. Would we work probably some sort of um, I'd have to look at the plan, but like a, a check-in entry area with kind of an overhang, something like that out of weather, but not not another office, not you know, not a big bathhouse. We just it's it's a two and a half million dollar bathhouse. So 
but, but we would have, I mean, the point is we'd have separate restroom, separate outdoor shower to accommodate the community yeah. portion separate from the school. But so yeah, so so no, our locker rooms are not touched. There is a facility for community use, and then there is the additional parking to accommodate what we've lost. Okay. And um, can we move those oak trees? Can we just cut down oak trees in Santa Barbara County and say? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's a no-brainer. I personally, we would have some conversations about the oak trees. Yes. Okay. And uh, okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? I, I have one more Sorry. question, if I may. Yeah. Um, Lisa, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but we would, in essence, we would be losing 37 slots, parking slots. We'd get 37 back. What's the estimate of people driving onto our campus to use the pool? Because I know after, oh gosh, by about January, most of the sophomores, a lot of them have their driver's licenses, and that front parking lot fills up to the max. Will we have enough parking for people coming on to use the community pool? I can't, it does, I mean, we're replacing it one for one, and right. I'd have to go back and look at the analysis we did with 1960. I was just curious, because I don't know if we're going to have public transportation dropping people off from different parts we of the valley, have, too, which would know, be okay. We, what we've talked about okay. is we've got the Y across the street, we've got the valley shuttle stop there, mm -hmm. and we'd basically be plugging into the public transit infrastructure right. that exists in that um, intersection. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I need to go back and look at the... We, I can speak to that just a little okay. bit. The plans that are currently drawn, um, if you, uh, there are actually about a dozen head-in parking spaces that go, that, that are, that go perpendicular right into the, um, the, the community pool. Okay. So there would be about a dozen of those there. Okay, so, um, you know, I guess it, it's equivalent, but I was just curious as to uh, if we were going to have any parking overload with people coming on to use the smaller pool. That's all. And not to complicate matters, but the conversation we did have with the county as part of the overall circulation plan and you know, master bike plan is there are some, uh, there were, I don't know if there will be funds available to re uh, orient mm -hmm. that Wutupio uh, portion with some parallel parking pedestrian and bike lane dedication along there, just from a safety and circulation standpoint, but we can also pick up some okay, that good. would be part of this project. I remember that originally, and I haven't seen it mentioned, so yeah, thank you. That would be, you know, that would be part three. So as far as what we're seeking for the board this evening is... Um, Anything else for me? So actually, do you mind just standing by just in case? So so twofold. One is in, in, in concept of the idea that for the 8.8 H standalone, uh, that's not something that we can financially do on our own. Um, I, I believe we would be able to muster the funds together for the 7.1. So in terms of a May conversation, I think some of those drilling down on some of those, uh, making sure these numbers are as solid as they can be at this point, but also some of the ongoing costs, because I've heard that from um, Jose Juan and Jen, you've asked that question too. Uh, we do have some numbers associated with both of those pools in terms of what utility costs would be, um, and, and we would bring those forward in May. If, if the board is amenable to this concept of an aquatics facility and would like more information to pursue this, um, we would we want to work on okay, what information um, would you all require for um, a, you know, an effective conversation in May? I think that maintenance, the electrical, those those costs. Utility costs. Yeah. Uh, also, if there's <clears throat> any personnel costs, yep. you need to have those. Um, anybody else? Any costs? I'd like to. Uh, yeah, uh, just as a member of the ad hoc committee, mm -hmm. we work with the foundation and the city of Hilton. Um, I, I think there's still more work to be done prior to get to a place of agreement. I understand this is not an action item. Uh, there's, still, there's still a lot of questions uh, that we generated that we have no answers to, and our task was to come back to our colleague board members <laughs> and give them an update in terms of what a memory could look like. So I think, I appreciate the discussion, it feels to me like you skipped a step, and did I miss something in our meeting? I'm not really sure. Um, I think it's helpful for folks to hear the, the, uh, the uh, correction on the overall right. budget. I just don't feel like I have enough to give my colleagues. I, I, I still have 
the same question is lingering in terms of the added cost of the district for years to come. Uh, we're talking about, yes, the programming and the lifeguard, and the, there's so personnel and what will that, what will safety look like and security, um, hearing about public uh, pool hours being open while students are on campus and in session, this is not an easy answer. And um, I think we need to be really diligent about assessing before we get to this place of, um, you know, the perception that somehow we're moving forward. I don't have the history. I don't know if this was just a community uh, conversation back in the late 80s when it was my understanding that students actually designed that greenery uh, that points towards the YMCA in, in, the, in the highway. And if that's true, I think there's some history there that we need to protect. I've heard briefly the, uh, the idea to push the parking lot into that corner. Well, it makes sense. But there's a history here because students develop that. Which class was it a gift? We can't just erase that, right? If I'm speaking online uh, or just based on my own understanding as a community member all these years, then 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 stand off. Uh, I think, in all fairness to the board, the district, and, and taxpayers, we need to have a solid understanding of the impact in future for the future when we are not here, um, because there are a lot of unintended uh, expenses that I foresee beyond electrical bills and water uh, and so on. So, so just then, have, have those questions been captured when you all met? Are those housed somewhere? Do you want to state those now? Or do they exist in a document somewhere? Well, we're going to come back and yeah. revisit that. We haven't had our second meeting, so yeah. that's okay. why I feel like this is premature to no, that's fine. Our meeting next Monday. Monday, yeah. yes. And I think much of that can and should and will be addressed in the MOU in terms of the operational and programming part of it. So, but I, I hear what you're saying. I, I think Mr. Corey wanted to bring you these new numbers and where we are so that you continue your consideration. Um, but yeah, we'll meet again on Monday. We look forward to your feedback on the MOU and your questions. And I, I, I can't remember if I told you, but we met with the Fulton. Yeah. Okay, so, and we're going to have their comments and input by like, Monday as well. So, <laughs> ideally, we will have that and, that, you know, get your feedback, figure out how we want it amended or what additional safeguards or assurances you'd like to, to include in there, and we can take it from there. Okay. Great. Sounds good. Yeah, and, and I guess this would be a good moment to, since we're live and publicly here, you know, just an invitation to community members to can to share their their thoughts and perspectives on this aquatics complex um, and their their vision, their the need. If that's you know anything they can contribute to our um, decision making would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you so much. Yes, of course. Great. Any other comments on this? Okay. Uh, we'll go on to number three, which is Valley School District Unification. And Steve, you um, asked for this on the agenda, and so I know you're going to lead the discussion. Yes. It's. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. This is a very weighty topic, and I just kind of want to touch on it briefly tonight. Um, I've had the opportunity. Well. Let me start at the beginning. Well, my wife and I moved here, here to the Valley in 2008. Um, just getting to know other parents, other teachers uh, uh, from different schools. Our kids have attended the schools in Buellton, Solvang, Dunn School, and here at the high school. And so we've had a, a wide experience in, with uh, different schools in the Valley. And a, a common theme that's always brought up with other parents is the redundancy of of the administration and redundancy of transportation, redundancy of cafeterias. And the question is always asked, why, why can't we combine or unify? And it just seems like a common sense question. And I, I don't have the answers. I don't pretend to have the answers. Um, I've talked to Susan Salcedo, uh, Santa Barbara uh, superintendent, and I've talked to some others, retired, who's given, given some insight and encouragement. I've talked to some political leaders. Every A lot of people want anonymity, so I don't want to say names. Um, 
but I, there is interest. I know there's interest, and I, I don't know what exactly where the starting point is. So that's why I guess I would like to defer to, to Jan. Uh, she has experience, a lot of experience, educational experience, and in administration. Um, I think, and, and you know, I, I know superintendents in this valley, and this is not a personal thing to anyone. And um, every job is important, and I'm not disparaging anyone by bringing this up, and I, I, I want to make that clear. But I think, and, and we do not have to offer this to all school districts. This is something where uh, someone in Ballard, where I don't know, the, the teacher student ratio is something like eight to one or something very low, may say, you know, we're good. We don't want to unify, or someone of those leaders may say, no, we're, we're good with our school. So we don't necessarily have to unify every school, and maybe they can come on board later when they see it and how successful it could be. I know Santa Barbara, if you, you know, 21 schools are, are unified together, uh, but they each keep their own independence. And uh, Jan, maybe you, can you tell, I, I don't, I've been told so many different things. I know Dos Pueblos, for example, their high school specializes in um, engineering and arts and San Marcos is math and Santa Barbara is science or something along that those lines where they still can keep their independence like we could in the valley. Do you know how that works with the high schools? I, I don't want to put you on the spot. Okay. No, um, I well, I can tell you that um, just in my experience um, with the Santa Barbara high schools that uh, they <clears throat> all three of the high schools have some key programs that are focused you know, their focus is they have like, different academies, per yes. se, okay? Like San Marcos has a health academy, the Apple Academy. Um, Dos Pueblos has the engineering academy. Uh, Santa Barbara High has the Mad Academy, which is their uh, uh, multimedia graphic arts program, et cetera. Um, I think, uh, and kids can go, you know, from one school, high school to the other if they want to be in a specific program they apply. It's an intra-district transfer kind of thing. Um, but I'm not quite sure how that plays, what you're trying well, to Well, what I'm, I'm not saying suggesting we do academies. I'm just okay. pointing out that the fact that even though they're unified, uh -huh. they still are allowed some independence. Oh. And I think if Buellton, Solomon, Los Olivos, San Inez worried about giving up some independence, not necessarily, depending on how this is structured. But as I mentioned a couple of meetings ago, the CDA, California Department of Education calls a unified school district, a school district that includes elementary, middle, and high school, and we're just a high school. So I think we could talk about unifying, but it, as I've said about other topics, it, it starts with the discussion. And I, I would like to see, and I think a lot of taxpayer citizens in the Valley would like to see a discussion. I know they would. So it, could we put together a study group or something to, to see to further discussion to see if we should go to individual school boards or to see if uh, what the next step could be to, to, to gauge the interest. Jim? Well, I don't know. What's the interest of, is the board uh, have any interest in it? In putting together a study group uh, to, I mean, this is, I can tell you this is a huge and daunting Task. Yes, I've been told it could take uh, from anywhere to two to ten years. And so, and like I said, it's, it starts with, I think it'd be extremely beneficial. I mean, we just got them talking about technology and raising money for technology. And that's where we're moving now. I, technology isn't the future. It's now. And we need more money. And we need more teachers in the classroom. Uh, here we could save a lot of money, potentially, by eliminating, by consolidating, I guess, put a positive spin on this, not spin, but perspective on it. It's, we could, by consolidating our administration, by consolidating our cafeterias, by consolidating our transportation, and it, and it, that would free up a lot of money. A lot of money that could go to the elementary schools, that could go to the middle schools, and that could go to the high school. Um, I will just uh, speak based on my experiences and, and knowledge. Uh, I, I mean, I think that there's a lot of uh, positives in the, in the sense of having, um, you know, a uni some type of unification or consolidation, if you will, um, and and that is the shared resources that you're talking about, Steve. You know, um, with you know, for example, with curriculum, with with uh, you know, food services, with 
maintenance of, with business services. I mean, there's no doubt that there's, you know, make, it would make sense. Um, what I find challenging in the Valley, and the Valley is very unique, it's in six or seven school districts, is that you have, I see the elephant in the room is, is uh, the funding model for the different districts because you have districts that are basic aid funded and then you have districts that are revenue limit funded. And um, there's, there's disparity as far as when you look at those dollar amounts, how much per pupil spending there is in different districts. And a district that has, let's say, um, you know, a basic aid district that I'll just throw out a number that has maybe 21,000 to spend per student. I'm just picking the number out of the air, okay? Are they willing to give up even that dollar amount to a lesser amount for a revenue limit that let's say is $11,000 or $12,000 per student um, in order to have shared services? Um, you know, that that's a, a huge issue. And technically, and Alicia, maybe you can help me out, that kind of changes the landscape as far as some districts have always been in basic aid. Some tend to float in and out of basic aid based on some specifics, et cetera. So when you're looking at uh, studying this, we have to keep in mind that what's here today may not be here tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so can I, um, before you answer that, before you answer that, that, this is a discussion I would love to see started with other school boards, with, with, uh, with the study group, with other people. This is a great discussion. And, and, and the people I've talked to who successfully unified, for example, Los Alamos and our orchid, it can be done. And we, there, yes, will it be challenging? That's what I start off by saying. Two to ten, three to 10 years, two to 10 years, challenge obstacles along the way, it can be done. Um, I, I, I just don't want to get into the technicalities and oh, let me tell you why it can't be done. I, I, I wanted to talk about having that discussion and opening up because there's a lot of people that are not in this room tonight. We talk about this and, and it's talked about by other parents and I need to see it squashed here. I'm wondering, we just seem to be adverse to having a discussion. Could we take it to the next level? If it gets squashed at that or, or maybe two or three steps after that, then so be it. At least we try. But can we agree to, to and that's why I asked you not, should we do a study group? What would, what do you think? And I, maybe uh, I should have had these conversations ahead of time. I, I want I want transparency, and I, I I think everyone does. And so I'd rather have the discussion here. And um, so, what do you, if we wanted to further the discussion, what would you say the best Could way I to go about that? Yeah. Sure. You know, what I was thinking about, Steve, is I think it might look kind of like a top-down power grab if. The high school saying we want to unify and obviously we have the superintendent we have this we have that what about getting together a group of people in the community who are interested in this and starting with a grassroots kind of thing and you know assume, uh, you know, we get people from all parts of the valley who are interested in this who can get together and maybe gin it up get ideas together bring it to the schools to their own individual districts that way it comes from the grassroots with people, the parents whose kids are in those schools can do that rather than we're sitting here, you know, oh, high school board. Yeah, right. They want, you know, all the power because it is, it comes down to a power thing, like it or not, with some of the little, you know, smaller school boards and people don't want to give up. the. I control. agree. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I couldn't like agree more. And, ground up. Yeah, that's fine. I, you know, I asked Susan Salcedo, why is, why would this be even the high school's responsibility? Why? This, every school would have a stake in this, and the, the, the high school is no more powerful than any other school board as I see it, and I agree. And by the way, as far as power grab, I won't be here on board in four years, so I will never I, I have didn't any mean power. Honestly, I just meant how but, No, no, I know, I know. No, I think we need to talk to the school board. So we need, someone said, well, talk to the superintendents. Well, if the superintendents, you know, or we're talking about eliminating superintendents, I don't know, that seems to me a non-starter. But I, I, yes, exactly, let's, it should be bottom up. And I think that's where this, this is where it comes from when I bring this up because people out there talk about this at the bottom. So uh, I guess the next question would be, and, and I, Tori, I appreciate what you're, you're saying because I, 
you know, I think that that's clearly if we initiate it, <clears throat> you know, it makes us look like, all right, you know, here's all the feeder schools and the high school is going to say, y'all come, let's do it this way kind of a thing. So it, sh it really should come from community interest, if the interest is there, okay, and, you know, who, who starts that? Does that, you know, um, putting somebody, somebody putting out something that says, hey, you know, if people are expressing, Steve, that there's an interest, you know, maybe going back to some of those people and saying, start it at the grassroots level, you know, if you have those contacts that you've been talking to people, perhaps, you know, building that group or that interest to, to, to do, you know, start putting some legs to it. I mean, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not being a turkey. No, the, the, in the I discussions I've had over the years, why don't you run for the school board and see if you can get that get that thing going? Now I'm on the school board, so I don't really want to hear. Yeah, why don't you go back, get off the school board, and start the ground roots? But I, I think this is I, 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 this isn't a power grab, and I I understand what you're saying. The perception is huge. This is a common sense um, way of looking at things, and we need to do something in order to take the next step to get it going or move forward to either progress with it or not. And I know there's, you know, the study has been done before I've been told in the past, um, but times change and, and um, uh, people move in and out of the valley, demographics certainly change. And I, I don't see any harm in re-looking at, re, reconsidering it. And if the best, I, you know, I don't know, again, how is this the responsibility of San Ynez uh, High School Board? I don't, because again, it's going to benefit the other school boards as well, um, and take their input. Obviously, their input. Could we call a meeting? Could we? I don't know. Well, I I was just going to ask the question. You know, is it our responsibility to initiate it? Is there interest in initiating it? Is it our responsibility to kill it? I don't think we'd be killing it. I think it's just a question of it. Is it our purview to say, okay, now we think that we all should get together and have a unified district. I would like no, to no, see a discussion. I, oh, okay. A discussion. I'd like to see it done somewhere else other than here at our high school, get a group together people and start from there and work out. There have been things like, I mean, the Aquatics Association, they started, you know, way back when, got groups of people together and built this community program, maybe talking to you know, other school boards going and visiting when they have meetings or PTSAs, starting with the PTSAs at each school and talking to them and seeing if people are interested. I think that could be very powerful as far as getting people together who are really interested in it. Then, of course, we would be interested in hearing what they had to say, but I would feel much more comfortable with it coming from other people because I, I think there's too much... Uh, I don't like the perception of us saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. And I think that would be read like that. So start, start with the PTSAs. Okay, Jose Juan, do you have any? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I appreciate you bringing that. I, I think it's an interesting question. I was wondering why we have five, six school districts in a very small community like this one. And I won't even pretend to know uh, and understand. I think that every, every school district is unique and they have their own needs. And I would imagine as we should, why, sh why should we? And what's in it for us? What will that do to our, our district? How will our, our needs be met? And I imagine that this is about economics and, uh, and who qualifies and who doesn't. And it's also about demographics and the way the valley is, is laid out, right? Um, in terms of resource sharing and, uh, or, or the pot of money, I would imagine there, I have so many more questions than I do answers so I'm not contributing to this dialogue. I think it's I think it's great. I, I all, I'm a believer in grassroots and going to the people. I think it's a great opportunity for the community to educate uh, themselves and for those who have the the uh, information to educate the community in terms of like we do in our classrooms. Look, let's put it all on the table. With, with the question we have in the center is should the center valley unify their school districts? Backward design. What do you want out of it? What is it going to take? And then start thinking about that and generating. I have a feeling <laughs> that uh, 
this is so massive by by the infrastructure of economic flow into these school systems that I don't think anything is anything is impossible. I think everything there's a lot of it's probably possible. I don't know that you and I will be here to see it. Realistically, um, I think it's great. I activate the community to see if there's a need because um, I'm also in the camp of probably should be driven by us board members um, with other board members. If anything, it would be inviting other board members in the districts and float the idea. Would this even be an interest uh, of yours to, to engage with one with, with this question? Um, and I have a feeling that conversation probably would look far with the collective. And so if the intent is a valid white unification, why would we easily veer off from enticing uh, Los Olivos and Ballard, et cetera? All of a sudden, we're already creating a division, a divide, and that's not a unification. That is who can we find our allies? And I think for the purpose of our board in our district, because we are the and to the high school education for all students in the valley, we ought to start thinking about how do we create a pipeline so that the other districts are preparing students for success in our district. And I would imagine that superintendents are having those conversations in their monthly meetings. And if they're not, they ought to. And I imagine, as an educator, I imagine they already have conversations about how are they going to set up their students to be successful in their formative high school years. And I, to me, is is uh, is where I like to dedicate a lot of energy and resources because we are so fortunate to have the resources to be able to um, have this, um, you know, like there's a level of, of comfort in knowing that our faculty and staff and our students are being taken care of financially for the next year. And that's a good place to be. Um, so, see, to, to your point, I, I'm curious. I, it would be great um, to ask those questions and get to a place of understanding. And it's a great education opportunity for me to learn more about the overall flow of funds um, in the different districts uh, and limitations that there, there are here. So do you have any? Yeah. It, you know, I, my wife and I always had our kids read the book, The Little Engine That Could. Um, <coughs> Uh, it, when we lived in Spain, we, we we took it over there with it, and when we helped kids learn, learn English, we we give them that book, and I, that's just where I come from. But, uh, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And if, if we want to surround ourselves with, yeah, I don't know if we can. I I really don't think we can get over that hill. We won't. And I start off. I think my first board meeting saying I'm a big believer in self fulfilling prophecy. If we keep telling ourselves we can't do anything, we will not do anything. We are surrounded. Santa Barbara, Unified School District. Lompoc, Unified School District. Santa Maria, the Unified School District. Much bigger school districts than we are. But, I, um, you know, we want, if you want to, I'm, I'm confused. I'm, and by the way, I'm not ruling out, if I came across the way, I'm not ruling out Los Olivos Valley. I haven't talked to people from there. One person on the school board there who, who had some reticence about it. So I'm, I'm saying they may not want to join. And if someone wants to dismiss my argument right away by saying they won't join, let's kill it. I wanted to get out ahead of that, but I'm not dismissing them as, as someone who wants to join. But like I said, the other meeting about talking about how, the, the, replacing the superintendent, these things start with a discussion or we can just squash the discussion and go on to the next agenda item. I don't understand why, why we're adverse. This is what we, we came on the board to do. It's not rubber stamp and just go along and next meeting. It's to discuss ideas. And if we want us to take our time and discuss the history of plants on, on Refugio from the 80s, you want to, we want to discuss that more. Why can't we have a discussion about, you know, you find this, this and, and overcoming the funding and overcoming and how we can do these things. And if we don't, we don't, but uh, I think a lot of people like to see it discussed. So I don't know what the best avenue is. I'll tell you what, in, the, in respect for everyone's time, why don't I speak to some people again? And Jan, if I can speak with you again without just you, so I won't 
Violet the Brown Act and see what what people would recommend the next step being. And I know there's a, the county has a council. I can see who's the, who has experience. This is so rare that not everyone has a lot of hands-on experience doing it at other levels. But let me do my homework a little bit more and see if I can come up with something more concrete. All right. Okay. I appreciate that, and I was going to suggest that if we get to a point where maybe we wanted to have just have um, some input from how it all works from the county, you know, they could they could help us with that. Yeah, they have a leaflet, which yeah. was I thought it would be an easy read. It was a very difficult read, yeah. but I can pass that around. I don't think there's any harm in doing that. Okay, great. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, on to um, item four, which is board policy updates. The first reading. Scott, do you have uh, anything on this? Okay, thank you. So, um, yes, in our um, never ending cycle of coming back to our and updating our board policies, you'll see a, um, actually a potpourri of different um, policies that are now outdated as well that need to be updated. And um, this is Westfall did a great job going back and selecting some that are more important to us moving forward. And so that's how this list was generated. Um, if the board has any questions on any of these policies, I'm happy to have a conversation um, uh, about that. Um, otherwise, we'll move for a second reading and approval in May. Anybody have, anybody have questions or comments? Sorry. Sorry. Straightforward. Terry, appreciate the summary. They're not going to go away. I know, I know. <laughs> the gift that keeps very, on giving. Very hard on these. Yeah. Yeah. Lindsay, did you have a question? All right, good. So um, with that, we'll go on to item I, which is board comments and correspondence. Um, anybody have comments or All right. Yes, I do. Okay. Sorry. Well, boy, we've heard enough of Steve Luke tonight. Okay. Um, uh, again, re respect everyone's time. I'll speak quickly. I just want to say a huge thank you to Michelle Borges and Ashley Coelho. And between this meeting and the last monthly meeting, we had a a girl's sport, uh, someone tested positive. Uh, we were told that uh, the season's canceled immediately. Sorry, the season's over, done. It's out of our hands, it's a county. Turns out that was not the case. It was our decision to make with the county's guidance. I spoke to with Dr. Dodd, who I believe is one of the deputy uh, county health directors, and she met, uh, because of Michelle Borges, because of Ashley Coelho, and their leadership met with them and uh, overturned the decision. And was it a right decision? Yeah, it was actually a brilliant decision because all the girls tested negative. The girl who tested positive, turns out it was a false positive. She took two more subsequent tests. All the girls continued to take tests for the rest of the season and they all remained negative. So thank you, thank you on behalf of the, our student athletes for stepping up and leading. So much appreciated. Um, I, one other thing, um, I, I, the last meeting, the special meeting we had about the, the what we're looking for with Ben Johnson, with the recruiter, some people texted me, called me. I, I, I think, I don't want to speak for the whole board, but I, I think I'm safe in saying we want the best candidate. Um, the, the color of their skin, the pigmentation, non-pigmentation, uh, their sex, their age, we want him to bring us the best candidates. We want to hire the best candidates. So I, 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 I think I can speak for everyone on that, but if, if anyone wasn't clear by that discussion. Um, can we, the WASP report for our RHS, are we gonna talk about that in at a board meeting? Did you That's say? It. Yeah, in May, yes. Both in May. Senate Senate's high school and Refugio. Excellent. The nice okay. thing about them, we'll have our results back from the WASP board. So, oh, wow. Uh, could they have their meeting? What day? I said you the date was April something. Yeah, coming up pretty quick. Coming up pretty quick. So we'll have our results from my mid cycle and our uh, yeah. Okay. Their, their recommendations will come to us. Great. Good. And the last thing I want to talk about, I think we've all seen this now, witnessed this firsthand as board members. Um, and I, I'm wondering if we can teach our freshmen and maybe discuss this at a later board meeting, put it on the agenda, teaching a, a class, offering a class for our freshmen on technology and how to handle technology, how to control technology, how to um, uh, Tori, could you help me? 
like social media social well. media and their for college and beyond. yes uh, this is something as a parent you know we had we had no experience in this and we have absolutely none and we've been thrown in our fire and our kids have really been thrown into the fire and if we can't do it as parents it, i think it'd be great if the school could help us out and we take a, a, a freshman course a part of the freshman course somebody could write a curriculum on how to handle it. I know as board members, we get attacked uh, online and through social media, very depressing. I can't imagine, I, I wanted to ask the wellness, their psychologist, what they, what our kids are going through. I, it's, and living in Europe and coming back here, I got this sense, some countries over there, they control it better than we do. And I think we, we don't have that control yet, but if we could, Talk about putting a course in the actually, curriculum. Actually, we do have one. So uh, mm. it just started this year. So we had hired, um, at, well, hired before I actually came on board um, were uh, Kelly Carter okay. and Strawberry in person from the song. Did you say that? <laughs> Did I say that correctly? So, um, so, so Kelly Carter is in charge of, uh, and she's been developing the tech, tech, you know, the tech piece of it. Um, and then Strawberry takes care of the health end of it. And embedded in both the tech end and the health end is the mental health or the social piece of it, you know, uh, and buried in there. And then um, we were working with them with counseling more recently in the tier one. So they're working; they're actually working with the tier one team alongside with uh, Stephanie Gagonis and um, and Claudia and Corey's been a part of that as well, uh, trying to develop. So when students come to us, the, you know, Scott's big thing was. I want to know when they get here, what's the transition, you know, how they learn how to navigate campus, how they learn how to navigate areas and all these, you know, big things, you know, just, just getting through the Office 365, those types of things. Um, also, social media, she's, I, Kelly's done a really great job with the kids, and it's, it, it, that, this is our first piloting year of trying to get all those components, so if there's specific things, um, yeah, because the curriculum has been developed, we're putting it into a nice little neat package at this point. And what happens is the freshmen, the first semester, you know, they split them between the two of them and then they swap the second semester. But we want some consistent things the first few weeks that they're getting, all freshmen are getting. And then in second semester, when they start talking about registering, career planning, those types of things. They're also doing that 10 year plan embedded in that. And we'll be talking about where the follow up happens after their freshman year. Their sophomore, junior, senior years. It, it would be great to have a, 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 a report. Yes. Or yes. have them a presentation. Okay. Because yeah. I think it's. The course of study has to. Be the course of study right? Yes. Because, yeah. Well, it's, it's embedded in there with development. Yes. So, so we'll that, that would be really cool. I, I would. Yeah, I would just, just even the, just the course of study, we could familiarize ourselves yeah, yeah. with it and if yeah. we have ask yeah. questions, study. Yeah. Right. And that, that course of study will be coming to the board before the end of the year. Great. Right. Make sure it's approved for the fall. Yeah, right. So it's been in, it's been in the development all year. Uh, one other thing we're going to have to think about it is um, just to throw it out there now because it may come up. Is you know there's there's been approved uh, ethnic studies um, that we that that some school districts have already adopted as a criteria. So that's going to be a big one for us to really spend time looking at tolerance, looking at you know ethnic studies and all those types of things. So. That's like, I'm like, okay, what, where do I start, you know, but, but making sure that that's on my radar. I already have the printout of the approved um, that information on the ethnic studies been approved by the CDE. So looking at that as well. When is that mandated? Is it mandated or do we have some mandated left? at this point. It's been um, adopted or looked at by the CDE. Uh, there are some school districts have, who have already um, adopted it as, a, you know, as, as, as one of their graduation requirements as well. Is it done under the aegis of social studies? Um, it could be. It doesn't have to be, but it could be. You okay. can do it like a world cultures and then embed it in your world cultures. So it doesn't have to be a course in a class in and of itself. There are standards in there that we could embed somewhere else if we needed to or create a whole entire course. So um, we just have to figure out where, you know, what grade level it's the met best or do we spread it out and put some components in different places so they grow with it because giving it all the freshmen by the time they're seniors, they 
Yeah, but we have to build that understanding of cultures and ethnicities and this. Right. Things. Well, your English department does such a terrific they job do. with all the multicultural literature that yes. that would be a, a good starting point. I think, Absolutely. Too. And like junior year, you know, when they're doing, um, you know, Martin Luther King and things, it seems across between U.S. history and and the, the junior English curriculum very well, beautifully it does. So we have to do those cross-curricular pieces. So if we look at the requirement of ethnic studies, we have some components that live in our classrooms already. We just need to make sure that, that we are looking at what those standards are and figure out where we can um, really beef it up and make it better, or do we do like, you know, embed it into another. Because you know, our, our hands are kind of tied right now because our requirements are, or, you know, you have know, that, um, that's all over. I'm not even going to so make that comment right now. But, but really, it's, it, it is there, and it's going to be, other than all of the other things, getting our freshmen transitioned and giving them those human tools, um, and then looking at, you know, and everybody always talks about, you know, when my kid leaves, how do they know about the finances? So where we also teach them about their own personal well being beyond and being prepared for college and all that. Um, as as financially. If I could suggest um, Santa Barbara Unified, uh, Maria Larios Horton is um, the go to person there that could probably shed some light and help. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Good. Pretty good. So, okay. yeah. Hang on to it. All right. Maybe I comment. Sure. Yeah. So, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's exciting. And that's uh, coming our way. Yeah. And, and thinking of hopefully the, the lens into it will be more aligned with the overall benefit that an ethnic studies uh, course uh, and uh, anti-bias uh, education, right, as, yes. it, as it preps yes. our students. And conscious bias training. All that. Or, or having hard conversations, right, it, it provides, yeah. That's great. Yeah, I've had unbiased, unconscious bias training through ACTS, and it's, I got some really great stuff. On that. All right. so, Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Um, so, so, all right. Um, so, item uh, J, board matters. Um, just a friendly reminder on your calendars uh, that May 18th at 5:30 is our next regularly scheduled board meeting. Okay. And with that, we are going to go into closed session. The time is uh, Terry. What does it say there? 10 of 8. Yeah. 750. Okay. And um, we will reconvene back here whenever we finish. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thank you so much. See you, Michelle. Okay. Thank you.